Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be doing an in-depth recap and reading vlog for Crown of Midnight by Sarah J. Mass, the second book in the Throne of Glass series. This is part of the Mass Effect read-along. Link the announcement video for that up above in case you missed it and you wanna come join us. We've been hanging out on Discord and chatting throughout it, which has been really fun. But we are doing a read-through. For me, it's a reread of all of Sarah's books. So this is my first time rereading the Throne of Glass series. In case you missed my video on Throne of Glass, the first book in the series. I will link that up above. It is very long and in-depth with all the Easter eggs and spoilers. I've read the first 10 chapters of the book. We're going to get into it and go chapter by chapter through it. So we are going to go through, do a recap of the plot, pick out any Easter eggs, things that are going to be important for later on in the book. It's been really fun for me and I hope that it's fun for you as you follow along. So let's go ahead and dive in and we're going to start at chapter one. I am writing and tabbing in my book. So when we left Selena at the end of book one, she had officially started working for the King of Otterlin as the King's champion. And so we're picking up here with her doing jobs for him. She's been doing it for a few months now. She's scaling the garden wall of a darkened manor house. She's supposed to assassinate Lord Mural, who's no older than 35. His wife is sleeping with him. His eyes fly open just as she raises her sword above his head. And that's kind of how how we cut off in chapter one is like, oh god, she's actually working as an assassin and killing these people for this king who we know is super sketchy, right? Perhaps things are not as they seem. <laughs> chapter two, we have her coming in to see the king of Otterlin. She is there to report. She is dragging a sack and then rolls it out and it is the, the head of her target mangled because he apparently woke up and resisted her. The king leaned forward, examining the mauled face and jagged cuts in the neck. I can barely recognize him. She says, I'm afraid severed heads don't travel well. So she throws out the seal ring. She also has the hand of, of the wife with a gold wedding band engraved with the date of their marriage that she gives to the king and then gives her her next assignment saying, there's a growing rebel movement here in Rifthold. Your next assignment is to root out and dispatch them all before they become a true threat to my empire. Selena seems really uncomfortable for this. So my first question reading this, of course, I've read this before, but I'm like, did she really kill him? Maybe it's not really him. And I, I the, with good reason. I don't know if it's that I was remembering the way that this went. So she's like, really? Rebels in the capital city? She'd met fallen rebels in the salt mine, but to have an actual movement growing in the heart of the capital and to have her be the one to dispatch them one by one and plans. What plans? What did the rebels know of the king's maneuvering? So she's got questions. So the king says he'll only give her one one name of a traitor at a time and that the first name is Archer Finn. She knows Archer. She's known him since she was 13 when he came and had lessons at the Assassin's Keep. He's several years older than her and at that point was already a highly sought after courtesan who was in need of some training on how to protect himself from his rather jealous clients and their husbands. She'd had a girlhood crush on him, practiced her flirting with him, and you know, hasn't seen him since all of this went on. So she's like, Ooh. He'd been handsome and kind and jovial, not a traitor to the crown so dangerous the king would want him dead. It was absurd. Just him or all his clients too, Selena blurted. The king gave her a slow smile. You know, Archer, I'm not surprised. I used to. He's an extraordinarily well-guarded man. I'll need time to get past his defenses. So he gives her a month. Your payment for your last kill is already in your chambers. And he keeps Neural's seal ring as a trophy. She is trying to make everybody think that she is actually killing these people. Dorian is kind of horrified, which I guess understandable. He thought he'd been able to convince his father to reevaluate his brutal policies after the massacre of those rebels in Ilway before Yulmis, but it seemed like it hadn't made any difference. And he says that Selena hadn't seemed like herself just now. For two months since she'd been named the king's champion, she had been like this. Her lovely dresses and ornate clothes were gone, replaced by an unforgiving close-cut black tunic and pants. Her hair pulled back in a long braid that fell into the folds of that dark cloak she was always wearing. She was a beautiful wraith. It was like she didn't even know who he was. So she's 
definitely distancing herself. She's creating this kind of dark wraith-like persona. Hale wants to debrief her on what exactly happened, how it all went down, and she's kind of irritated about that. They hug each other. It says as she held him now, the craving for it never to stop roared through her. But then he jokingly is like, gods, you smell horrible. And she's like, well, yeah, I was carrying like rotting heads. Of course I do. She meets Fleetfoot and we have these like little moments, I think for people who love pets in this, her dog Fleetfoot shows up, cute little moments of them playing together and cuddling and whatever. So we get some of that. And then we discover all is not as it seems. King had believed her and Kale hadn't once doubted her story as he inquired about her mission. She couldn't decide if it made her feel smug, disappointed, or outright guilty, but the lies had rolled off her tongue. So the truth is that she's been lying for the last two months, even for her first kill that she was assigned, she was going to do it, but then she saw how kind he was to his servants and realized she couldn't couldn't do it, couldn't kill people for the king. So she gave Lord Neral the same choice she'd given Sir Carlin, the first one, die right then or fake his own death and flee, flee far and never use his given name again. So far, of the four men she'd been assigned to dispatch, all had chosen escape. It wasn't hard to get them to part with their seal rings or other token items. So this is how she's been able to pull it off so far. In terms of where she's getting the bodies, sick houses were always dumping fresh corpses. It was never hard to find one that looked enough like her target. If she messes up the face a little bit, which is kind of gross, but okay. But she's not sure how she's going to fake Archer's death because he's so well known. They've got a relationship from the past and he lives in the capital city. One thing that I think is important later is it says there were other continents, of course, other continents with wealthy kingdoms like Wendlin, that faraway land across the sea. It had held out against his naval attacks so far, but she'd heard next to nothing about that war since before she'd gone to Endovir. Wendlin is going to end up being important in this series, so take note. We'll see it come up again. And that is pretty much chapter two, is her being like, if the king finds out, he'll destroy her. Chapter three starts with Selena having a nightmare of Cain chasing her and kind of creepy things happening. There is a moment at the end, though, where it says Cain grabs her and whispers her name her true name. Hmm, what is her true name? We're gonna find out. We know from book one she's got a true name that we don't know of yet. We get some moments with Selena and Nehemia who have continued to develop their friendship. Nehemia is trying to win over Queen Georgina and get information about the king's plans for Ilwe. Selena wonders if the king knows that the princess is one of the spies he'd mentioned. I think he knows, but he's biding his time. She's like, he can't know because we're friends. We have a moment too where we find out that Fleetfoot is abnormally large. Dorian had never said what breed exactly he suspected her mother had mated with. Given Fleetfoot's size, it could have been a wolfhound or an actual wolf. I think that ends up being important later on as well, but I don't remember the details, so stay tuned. I, I have an inkling of why that might be important, but I, I'm pretty sure that is important. She talks to Nehemia about the king's assignment for her, and they're both kind of wondering why is it that there would be rebels in the capital city. Again, I think Nehemia is a great character, and the fact that she's gonna end up dying the way that she does, I'm still upset about, but we do have descriptions that remind us her creamy brown face hailed slightly. There, there was another thing somewhere in here as well that I noticed. So we're continuing to be made aware she is a person of color, which could have been done better. I will say she is also not telling Nehemia the truth about what she's doing. She's trying to make sure that everybody thinks she's actually killing these people. And she's saying they had to believe the lies for their own safety. She's always trying to protect other people, even at cost to herself. Nehemia is concerned. She feels like she needs to act and do something. We have Kale and Selena going on their morning run. They've apparently continued to keep this up. He kind of teases her for not keeping up with him. This was a blatant lie. She kept up with him easily now, nimble as a stag bounding through the woods. I think it's funny that she's comparing her to the stag since like this the stag is a symbol of Terrison and so I feel like again this is a nod to Selena's true identity just in some little little way kind of a, an easter egg type nod. He's still bothered by the fact that he killed Kane. A little silly to think that that was the first and only person he's ever had to kill as the captain of the guard but okay they're bonding over their trauma. Uh, Selena says I'll never forget the people I've killed even the ones I killed to survive. I still see their faces. 
it takes away a little piece of you each time. And she says, I'll never forget what you did to save me. There's this, you know, kind of romantic tension between the two of them, but Kale's not crossing that line with her. He'd seen the way Dorian still looked at her. He couldn't betray his friend like that, which I think is interesting because Kale doesn't think that Selena and Dorian should be together. And he was happy when Selena said that she broke things off with the tryst that they had in book one. So I'm not sure how much sense this makes, but it's fine. It turns out that because Kale's been doing these runs with Selena and looking hot and sweaty, all the ladies of the court are now making their way to the garden to walk around early in the morning. I think one thing about this book is that aside from Nehemia, a lot of the female characters are presented as being kind of silly and, you know, we have a little bit of this like, they're not like the other girls thing. Again, this is very of its time, but it could be better. We meet Dorian's cousin Roland, who is pretty terrible from the get-go, and if I remember correctly, he only gets worse as time goes on in the series. He is blonde, about the same age as Dorian, and from the very beginning, Selena's like, mm, I don't know. Lord Roland Havilliard of Mia, he asks Selena what sort of work she does for his uncle, and she says, I bury the king's opponents where nobody will ever find them. He chuckles and says, I'd heard about the king's champion. I didn't think it would be someone so lovely. He's very kind of flirty, but in a sketchy way, and we find out that his majesty has offered Roland a place on his council. There is something very weird about this because the more we learn about Roland, the more we learn nobody else really likes him. He's not super skilled or good at diplomacy. Why is he getting a spot on the council? Hmm, is he maybe a part of the schemes that the king has going on, perhaps? Dorian says he'd never particularly liked his cousin, who he'd seen at least twice a year growing up, and Kaol hated Roland calling him a conniving wretch and a sniveling spoiled ass. After Selena and Kale take off, Roland is asking Dorian questions about Selena, but they're calling her Lillian, her pseudonym. She has so many names in the series, like so many names. And he says, is she for your father's personal use or do the other councilmen also employ her? And th this is weird and gives off sketchy vibes in a lot of different ways. Mm, I don't know. We have Selena going and spending all of the blood money that the king gives her, buying, you know, clothes, shoes, jewelry, weapons, and lots and lots of books. Dorian goes to see her when she's getting back from a shopping trip, and she's wearing a lilac and ivory gown, so we get more clothing descriptions. I like the clothing descriptions. Dorian is missing her. He wants to hang out with her and see her and she kind of says no and feels like she has to take a hard line. He's like, do you want me to fight for you? Is that it? And she says, no, I just want you to leave me alone. Pretty harsh. Granted, she is going to see Archer. So that's chapter four. Chapter five, she starts tracking Archer. So she's tracking his movements. Again, he's a courtesan or, you know, a sex worker, essentially. She follows him to a house of his client, Lady Balanchine. We get a little bit more on Selena's background, where she's reminded of Sam, who was her first love and the person who died right around when she was imprisoned. We talked more about this in book one. It says, it had been over a year and a half since the night she'd lost her freedom, a year and a half since she'd lost Sam. And somewhere in this city were the answers to how it all had happened. If she dared to look, she knew she'd find them, and she knew it would destroy her again. She knows one day she's gonna have to go confront Arabin Hamill, the head of the Assassin's Guild who trained her. She knows, but she's not really ready to do it yet. But, you know, first step is gonna be reconnecting with Archer. We've got a cozy scene of her and Kale and a description of his neatly organized room with a small alphabetically arranged bookshelf, which is cute. And he's wondering why she hasn't killed Archer already. She says, oh, well, maybe it'll reveal more conspirators or clues to their whereabouts. She asks why he hates Roland. I never said I hated him. I think it's fairly easy for you to see why I hate him. There were many incidents and I don't particularly feel like talking about any of them. It seems like he was probably really terrible with women. Then, I'm not sure where it comes from, but she asks him, do you know who Rourke Farron is, the crime lord? And Kale tells her he's dead. Farron's dead? Nine months ago, he and his three top men were all found murdered. A man named Wesley took them out. He was Arab and Hamel's personal guard. There are lots of things going on here, and I we're about to learn more information, but this is really important, I think, for 
understanding the history of how Selena ended up being betrayed and imprisoned. For years with Arabin, Wesley had been a silent deadly presence, a man who barely tolerated her and always made it clear if she'd ever become a threat to his master he would kill her. But on the night she'd been betrayed and captured, Wesley had tried to stop her. She'd thought that it was because Arabin had ordered her locked in her rooms, that it had been a way to keep her from seeking retribution for Sam's death at Ferran's hands. But maybe not. And he says, we found Wesley a day later, courtesy of Arabin Hamel, impaled on the iron fence outside Rourke's house. Here's what happened. Supposedly this crime lord brutally killed and tortured Sam. Selena found out about this, wanted to go get revenge. Wesley, the bodyguard to Arabin, was like, no, you shouldn't. But she did it anyway. It was a trap. And that was how she got caught. Like, is it a clear indication that Arabin was probably the person who set her up and betrayed her? Yes. Does she want to see that because he was sort of a father figure, if an abusive one in her life? No. So I think that's really interesting. It says, the night she'd broken out of the assassin's keep to hunt down Ferran, Wesley had tried to stop her. He'd tried to tell her it was a trap why Arab and Hamel might have betrayed her, and what she was going to do with that horrible knowledge, how much she'd make him suffer and bleed for it. So I think she is beginning to accept the fact that he was probably the one who did it, but she doesn't want to confront him yet, but she may have to at some point. So she tells Kaol that what Wesley did was an act of revenge. She also says she doesn't even know where they buried Sam. So that's... I think an important piece of information. And then Kaol opens up about the woman who got involved with Roland Lithian. Lithian? Three years ago she worked for one of the ladies of the court and Roland somehow found out and thought it would be amusing for me to discover him in bed with her. I know it's nothing like what you went through but he even convinced her to go back to Mia with him though I never learned what became of her. You loved her. I thought I did. Did Sam love you? Yes. More than anyone had ever loved her. He loved her enough to risk everything, to give up everything, which indicates that maybe she and Sam were planning to leave Arabin and run away, and maybe he found out and was pissed about it. Maybe. Seems likely. And then Selena decides to go to the library and has kind of a creepy experience. Outside the doors to the library, she sees someone completely concealed by a black cloak hood drawn far over the face. There's something that feels off about it. The person swivels its head towards her and pauses. It was just a person, she told herself, as the figure now turned to face her fully, a hood so heavy it concealed every feature of the face inside. It sniffed at her, a huffing animal sound. It sniffed again and took a step toward her. The way it moved, like smoke and shadow, a faint warmth bloomed against her chest, then a pulsing blue light. The eye of Elena was glowing. The thing halted and Selena stopped breathing. It hissed and then slithered a step back into the shadows beyond the library doors. The tiny blue gem in the center of her amulet glowed brighter and Selena blinked against the light. When she opened her eyes, the amulet was dark and the hooded creature was gone. Ooh. Okay, so we know she's been wearing this amulet, the Eye of Elena, for a while, even though she says earlier in the book she hasn't seen Elena. And if you remember in the last book, she has assumed that it didn't do anything for her with the Ritterac, even though I think it was probably because she moved. Now this is showing me that I think it is protecting her. It's unclear whether maybe it's concealing her when it activates from these creatures, but clearly there's something off about this creature trying to enter the library. If I'm remembering right, I think this does a good job of making a library a really creepy place. If your audience is people who are used to finding comfort and safety in a library, it's, it's pretty effective. So I think this is a really interesting passage. And that is the end of chapter five. Chapter six, there is a lunar eclipse. She wants to go see Elena during the lunar eclipse. So she heads down to the, the tomb where she might see her ghost. When she gets to the door, the skull knocker talks to her and says, aren't you going to knock? And as it turns out that it hadn't revealed itself before, but we get this kind of silly interlude with her talking to this <laughs> magically alive sort of skull knocker. And I've got to say, I don't mind this. Does it feel a little bit like a way to get us some important information? 
kind of. Is it sort of silly? Yes. But okay, I guess you just kind of go with it. So the the skull knocker has a bit of an attitude and is like, don't be so pathetic. I'm attached to the store. I can't harm you. But you're magic. It should be impossible. Magic was gone. Everything in this world is magic. Thank you ever so kindly for stating the obvious. But magic doesn't work anymore. New magic doesn't. But the king cannot erase old spells made with older powers, like the word marks. Those ancient spells still hold, especially ones that imbue life. Selena asks, is she in there? Is who in there? Elena, the queen. Of course she is. She's been in there for a thousand years, because her body is in there. Don't mock me or I'll peel you off this door and melt you down. Not even the strongest man in the world could peel me from the store. King Brannon himself put me here to watch over her tomb. So the skull knocker has apparently been there for a thousand years to watch over, watch over the tomb. I feel like this is just giving us some information about history of magic, but it's fine. I guess it's comedic relief maybe is, is the idea. Okay, I'm editing quick addition to this because I didn't think about it until the live stream. But it is worth noting with the Star Knocker, this is not the only time that she has given a personality to an inanimate object. And in some cases, I really love it. Like in Court of Silver Flames, we have a animated house, which I love. So this is, I, I hadn't realized this was something she started doing so early on, but this is something we see her do again in her work. She asks what its name is. It's like, well, what's your name? When she's like, Selena Sardothian. The skull laughs at her and is like, that's funny. The funniest thing I've heard in centuries. Obviously, because we know it's not really her name and clearly the skull knows that. The skull knocker's name is Mort. Turns out Elena's ghost is gone, but she left a message with the skull knocker in case Selena came by, because of course she did. Elena needs to regain her strength because she ex expended too much helping Selena earlier. Yet again, Selena notices the words etched at Elena's feet. Ah, time's rift which someone reminded me this ends up being like a code for something. So we're being reminded yet again that it is there, even though it's a small thing. Elena's fey father, not to mention the first king of Terrison, had carved the words into the sarcophagus himself. The whole tomb was strange, actually. Stars had been carved on the floor, and trees and flowers adorned the arched ceiling. The walls were all etched with word marks, the ancient symbols that could be used to access a power that still worked. Again, as I said in book one, when we're in this tomb, the stars on the floor definitely feels like a tie back to a place that we encounter in House of Flame and Shadow that is also a long forgotten location with stars etched on the floor. So that's an interesting connection there. She looks at the suit of armor, from the king and Damaris, the legendary sword of Gavin. This is also being brought back up as it had been mentioned in book one. So we know that it's something that's gonna be important. Its hilt was silvery gold and had little ornamentation save for a pommel in the shape of an eye. No jewel lay in the socket. It was only an empty ring of gold. Some legends claimed that when Gavin wielded Damaris, he would see only the truth. And that was why he had been crowned king or some nonsense like that. Clearly, this is not nonsense. This is in fact important. There's no jewel in the socket, but it's shaped like an eye, maybe similar to the eye of Elena. Is that blue jewel supposed to go in here? I don't remember, to be honest. It's been so long since I've read these, but I feel like there's something important here where Selena's eventually going to need this. She does wonder where Elena's armor is because somehow it's disappeared. Maybe we're going to find it in the future. Where had it gone? People liked to forget that women were warriors. The message from Elena, if I could leave you in peace, I would, but you have lived your life aware you will never escape certain burdens. Hmm, certain burdens. Whether you like it or not, you are bound to the fate of this world. As the king's champion, you are now in a position of power and you can make a difference in the lives of many. Cain and the Ritterach were just the beginning of the threat to Aurelia. There is a far deadlier power poised to devour the world. And I have to find it, I suppose? Yes, there will be clues to lead you to it. Signs you must follow. Refusing to kill the king's targets is only the first and smallest step. She mentions the things she saw in the hallway outside the library. She's like, it's all connected to the king, isn't it? All these awful things, even Elena's command, that's about finding whatever power he has, the threat he poses. You already know the answer to that. It is your fate and your responsibility. She doesn't want to believe in fate, but clearly he's not wrong. You must discover where the king's power comes from and what he plans to do before it's too late. 
she is definitely a reluctant hero. She's like, well, where was Elena 10 years ago? Where was she when all the kingdoms were falling to the king? The world is already in ruin. I won't be set on some fool's errand. And then Mort says, I'm sorry for what you've lost. And I'm sorry about your parents' death that night. It was, don't you ever talk about my parents. What's interesting too is he said this in a voice that was not quite his. So I do wonder if maybe this is Elena speaking through Mort at some point. I, I don't know. Mort yells at her and calls her selfish and cowardly. And she's like, shut your face and runs away because she's super mature like that. And that is chapter six. Chapter seven, she wakes up with a headache and she realizes the Mort was kind of right. She just wanted Elena to deal with the thing in the hallway and didn't want to have to do it herself. If Elena was warning her to uncover the king's plans and find the source of his power, his plans had to be really bad. Really bad. Even worse than killing all the people he had already and enslaving people. So she realizes she needs to speak with Archer and find a way to convince him to fake his own death. So she goes to the Willows, a fancy tea court where she knew Archer was having lunch. He seemed to dine here every day with a few other male courtesans. Of course, it had nothing to do with the fact that most of Rifthold's elite patronesses also dined here. So Kaol comes with her. For whatever reason, Selena decided, oh, even though it's cold and wet, let's walk there to this fancy place in my dress that's gonna get dirty <laughs> instead of taking a carriage. And then she's like, come to think of it, a carriage probably would have made a better entrance too. I'm like, yeah, you're supposed to be like the, the smart, savvy <laughs> assassin. <laughs> Come on, get it together. They get in there. She is able to find a way to run into him. And he's like, Lena? Because he used to call her Lena. So Lena is like a nickname, which of course, Kale hates the fact that he has a nickname for her. And he is not handsome, but beautiful. His skin glowed golden even in the height of winter and his green eyes, gods above and words save me. His mouth was a work of art too, all sensual lines and softness that begged to be explored. So clearly that girlhood crush has not quite fallen off yet, has it? He has expertly tailored tunic and pants. None of it screamed wealth, but she could tell it was expensive. His appeal had always been more ruggedly masculine. The broad muscled shoulders and powerful frame, the knowing smile, even his beautiful face radiated a sense of maleness that had her struggling to remember what she'd planned to say. I don't know what a sense of maleness is, but... All right. He's like, I almost didn't recognize you. You were just a girl when I saw you last. You were gods above. You were 13, I think. I'm not 13 anymore. <laughs> it would certainly seem that way, he replies. So there's, you know, flirtation between the two of them. She says she still remembered how adept Archer had been at taking in details. Probably part of the reason he'd become the top male courtesan in Rifthold and a formidable op opponent when Selena was training at the Assassin's Keep. So I think he's going to pick up on things probably and might make a good spy. He's like, how did you get out? And she says, I, would, I was let out by the king. I work for him now. Does Arabin know you're back? And she says that was not a question she'd prepared for or wanted to hear. He has eyes everywhere. I'd be surprised if he didn't know. So she invites him to dinner the next night and he agrees. Kaol is kind of jealous because he can tell that some of her blushes weren't just acting. And I'm like, dude, you need to get over it. He's like, I wanted to fight him, but he, he didn't. And he's like, Lena? Ugh. She says, my history with Archer will allow me to get him to provide information about whatever this rebel movement is. He is one of the few people who actually likes me, you know, or he did years ago. Shouldn't be too hard to get some inkling of what this group might be planning against the king or who the other members might be. Kale kind of lets it go and it says he'd seen the look on her face when Archer had mentioned Sam. He'd heard of Sam Cortland's death and passing. He'd never known that Selena and Sam had crossed paths, that Selena had ever, ever loved that fiercely because Archer says, I'm sorry about what happened to Sam when they had met up. And so he's like, oh, so Sam is important to her. And apparently he didn't know this before. And he realizes that when she had gotten caught, it was for revenge, not just for money. Chapter eight, she has to assist with guard duty per the king's orders at a state dinner. So we've got Duke Parrington back again, who is the worst there with Dorian and Roland, who we're finding is also kind of the worst. There was something about Roland's emerald eyes that made her want to pull Dorian as far away from him as possible. 
Dorian was playing a dangerous game too, she realized. As crown prince, he had to walk a careful line with certain people. Why hadn't Elena approached Kael for her tasks? I wonder why. I wonder, Selena, why it could be that Elena is picking you. Hmm. Dorian is jealous of the way she's looking at Kale. I mean, all of this is really silly. The the sort of quasi love triangle stuff. It, it's pretty juvenile. I don't care that much about it, to be honest. I think the romance elements of this book get better, much better farther into the series. I'm just, it, it's whatever at this point. Dorian decides he's going to go to the Royal Library, which seems like a bad idea, given what was previously waiting outside. They have a conversation about Roland. He's harmless. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he has his own agenda in being here. He's got little to lose and a lot to gain. That makes people dangerous, ruthless. He'll use you if he can. And he accuses her of using him to become the king's champion. And she's like, really? I'm not having this conversation right now. I came to warn you about your cousin, but you clearly don't care. So don't expect me to care when you find yourself nothing more than a puppet if you aren't one already. It's like so much drama between the two of them. And she just like walks off. Then she goes to see Caltaine. Remember Caltaine, the girl that was on opium and like poisoned her. So she's in a cell and she's been treated really terribly. Dress is soiled, her dark hair unbound and matted, her skin gleamed with sweat and had a slightly grayish hue and the smell. So she's she has not been doing well. And we go to chapter nine where they have more of a conversation. Caltaine's like, have you come to laugh? Lane asks what Caltaine knows about Roland. I want to know if he can be trusted. None of us can be trusted, especially not Roland. The things I've heard about him are enough to turn even your stomach, I bet. Ugh. Like what? Caltaine's like, get me out of the cell and I might tell you. She notices bruises around her wrists that look like handprints. And Caltaine says the Night Watch looks the other way when Parrington visits. She's definitely being mistreated, which Selene is going to try to do something about. They encourage the crows to fly past here. And my headaches are worse every day, worse and worse and full of all those flapping wings. Selena's like, I don't hear any crows or flapping wings. Caltaine is hearing something from that other world because, and, and it's kind of dumb that Selena doesn't remember this, that when she went into that poisoned vision state, she saw like flapping wings and stuff like that. It's probably the same thing Caltaine's talking about, but Selena's like, uh, it's probably just because she was on opium. She's losing it. Caltaine says, sometimes I think they brought me here not to marry Parrington, but for another purpose. They want to use me. I think she's smarter than she seems. Use you for what? They never say. When they come down here, they never tell me what they want. I don't even remember. It's just fragments. Yeah, because they're purposefully making her forget stuff. I think Selena's not fully getting it. Caltaine says, something is coming and I am to greet it. Uh-oh, what's coming? Like, Caltaine is trying to tell you something, and Selena just is like, this conversation is pointless, and she leaves her behind. Okay, the last part of this chapter is her having a conversation with Nehemia. She invites her for breakfast in bed, and so the princess hops under her warm covers. I feel like, honestly, this whole scene of them having this, like, intimate friendship and, like, hanging out in bed together, like, could be re read as queer-coded. I don't know that that's necessarily the intention of Sarah, but it's it's definitely how it, it could be read. We find out that Selena told Kale about how Caltaine had been treated in the dungeons, and he dealt with it, which is good, and uh, it looks like there were going to be some serious changes to the guards, thank goodness. They're eating breakfast in bed together and just, like, hanging out. Nehemia shook her head, her gold-tipped braids tinkling. In the early morning sun, her hazelnut skin was smooth and lovely. Honestly, it was a tad unfair that Nehemia naturally looked so beautiful, especially at the crack of dawn. Like, hazelnut skin, that's, I know that that's a little bit of a no-no of, like, using food words to describe people of color's skin, but again, I don't know that people were talking as much about that when this was written. 2013, this came out in 2013, so it's, it's been a while. Nehemia says, I think such honor faded from Otterland generations ago, but before Terrison fell, its royal court was one that set the example. My father used to tell me stories of Terrison's court, of the warriors and lords who served King Orlon in his inner circle, of the unrivaled power and bravery and loyalty of his court. 
That was why the King of Otterland targeted Harrison first, because it was the strongest, and because if Harrison had been given the chance to raise an army against him, Otterland would have been annihilated. Selena looked toward the hearth. I know she managed to get out. Of course she knows, because she is from Harrison, and, I mean, we're doing spoilers, that's her family. So she knows that this is what the court used to be like. It's part of why she's so jaded, because of what happened to her family. Nehemia says, do you think another court like that could ever rise again? Not just in Harrison, but anywhere? I've heard the court in Wendland still follows the old ways, but they're across the ocean and do us no good. Here's Wendland again. They're going to be important eventually. They looked in the other direction when the king enslaved our lands, and they still refuse all calls for aid. Which eventually they're going to have to do something about. And Selena's like, let's just stay in bed all day. I wish I could, Nehemia said, sighing loudly. Alas. I have things to do. And so did Selena, like preparing for her dinner that evening with Archer. And that brings us to chapter 10, the last chapter I have read so far. And we begin with Dorian in the kennels, hiding out from Holland, his psychotic 10 year old brother who had returned from school shrieking, but he hates animals, which I mean, that goes with the psychoticness. He's like, why did my mom bring him back from school? Dorian sighed. I don't even want to imagine what sort of absurd gift my mother bought him. Do you remember the last one? Kale grinned. It was hard not to remember the last gift Georgina had bought her younger son. Four white ponies with a tiny gold carriage for Holland to drive about himself. He'd trampled half the queen's favorite garden. So, you know, spoiled and psychotic. Maybe he's changed in the past few months. Matured a little, Kale said. You said that last summer, and I almost punched his teeth out. So... <laughs> Not, not feeling too hopeful. Kale shook his head. Think the word my brother was always too afraid of me to talk back. Dorian tried not to look surprised. Since Kale had abdicated his title as heir of Anil, he hadn't seen his family in years and rarely spoke about them. Dorian could have gleefully killed Kale's father for disowning him, refusing even to see Kale when he brought his family to Rifthold for an important meeting with the king. Even though Kale had never said it, Dorian knew the scars went deep. A little bit more background with Kale and some of the issues he has with his family. Kale mentions that Selena has dinner plans with Archer Finn. Isn't she supposed to kill him? She wants information, apparently. I don't like him. Dorian says, I don't think you need to worry about Archer stealing her away, especially if he's going to be dead by the end of the month. Kale cut a glance at him. You think that's what I'm worried about? Yes, and it's obvious to everyone except the two of you. Because, yeah, all, all the jealousy, all the jealousy in here. So, Selena wears a very scandalous, low cut red dress, low enough to reveal through the black lace mesh in the back that she wasn't wearing a corset beneath it. So, of course, Kaol stops dead and blinks and is like, You're not wearing that. Oh, yes, I am. You're going to catch your death. So she wraps an ermine cloak around her. Now, with this, I won't. Do you even have any weapons with you? Because I'm sure, yeah, that's what he's concerned about. Does she have weapons? Yes, Kaol, I have weapons. And I'm wearing this dress because I want Archer to ask the same thing, to think I don't have any on me. There were indeed knives strapped to her legs and the pins sweeping her hair into a curling cascade down one shoulder were long and razor sharp, commissioned to her delight by Philippa, so she didn't need to go traipsing around with cold metal jam between your breasts. I love Philippa. I think she's a fantastic character. We haven't gotten much of her in this book, but I feel like we need more of it. I love that she commissioned some uh, razor sharp hairpins. And then Kale freaks out when she's like, oh, I'll see you tomorrow. He's like, what do you mean tomorrow? You're a smart boy. Figure it out yourself. <laughs> Good night, she said, and before she could reconsider all that she'd just implied, she got into the carriage and drove away. She'd worry about Kale later. So Archer's waiting for her in a dining room, and you know, they have some back and forth flirtatious banter. He mentions that he still has debts to Clarice, the most influential and prosperous madam in the capital. He asks how she came to work for the king. Turns out my skills are better suited to aiding the Empire than they are to mining. Working for him and working for Arabin are nearly the same. Our professions have always been similar, yours and mine. I can't tell which is worse, training us for the bedroom or the battlefield. If she recalled correctly, and this is his, we're about to get his backstory, which is pretty terrible, honestly. He'd been 12 when Clarice had discovered him as an orphan running wild in the capital's streets and invited him to train with her. And when he'd turned 17 and had the bidding party for his virginity, there had been rumors of actual brawls breaking out among would-be patronesses. 
ew. Not a great life and training to be a courtesan from the age of 12, like, yeah. He was a weapon too. A beautiful, deadly weapon. He leaned over the edge of the table, pinning her to the spot with his stare. A challenge and an intimate invitation. Gods above and words save me. It's going to take more than a few sultry glances to make me your willing slave, Archer. You should know better than to try the tricks of your trade on me. He let out a low, rumbling laugh that she felt in her core. And I think you know well enough to realize when I'm not actually using them. If I were, then we would have left the restaurant already. <laughs> That's a bold, bold claim. I don't think you'd want to go head to head with me when it comes to tricks of the trade. Oh, I want to do a lot of things with you. She'd never been so grateful to see a servant in her life and never realized that a bowl of soup could be so immensely interesting. So eventually she gets in his carriage after dinner. They've kind of kept up normal chatter. The carriage rolls to a stop in front of his townhouse. Archer looked at her and gently twined her fingers with his before raising her hand to his lips. It was a soft, slow kiss that burned through her. He murmured onto her skin. Do you want to come inside? She swallowed hard. Don't you want a night off? It's immensely different when it's my choice, you know. Someone else might have missed it, but she'd also grown up without choices and recognized the glimmer of bitterness. She eased her hand out of his. Do you hate your life? Her words were barely more than a whisper. He looked at her, truly looked at her, as though he somehow hadn't seen her until just now. Sometimes, he said, and his eyes shifted to the window behind her and the townhouse beyond it. But someday, he went on, Someday I'll have enough money to pay off Clarice forever, to really be free and live on my own. Not necessarily the life he wants, but it's the life he's ended up in. But finally, she took a steadying breath and looked him in the eye. It was time. The king sent me to kill you. And that's the end of the chapter. <laughs> So I am going to read the next 10 chapters and then I will be back and we will discuss how things go. So far I'll say I'm enjoying this reasonably well, maybe a little bit less than book one. I feel like there's a lot of stupid drama of people being jealous of each other that I'm like, oh, okay, whatever, like l l let's, let's move it along. But you know, having a, a reasonably good time with it. I am back. I've read chapters 11 through 20 and we're going to talk about them. Overview, I would say I am feeling a little bit less engaged than in Throne of Glass. It's interesting because in the Discord for the read-along, some people are saying this one feels a little bit repetitive and I kind of see what they're saying. I feel like there's elements of it that are interesting and then elements of it that feel like ground that's just being rehashed a bit, especially the stuff with the love triangle with Kaol and Dorian. I, I'm just not invested. <laughs> and you'll see this as we get to the details, but I don't know how much of this is because I've read the entire series and I know what's going to happen and how much of it is because going back and rereading it, it just doesn't grab me as much. I mean, it may be because I know what happens. That may be part of the problem. I will say there are some pieces of this that are interesting where we're getting more information. There are quite a few Easter eggs, so some of it has been fun. Chapter 11, we're picking up where Archer's freaking out because Elena just said, the king sent me to kill you. He's like, please, please, I can pay you. Don't kill me. And she says, the king thinks you're part of a rebel movement that's interrupting his agenda. He says, I'm not part of any movement. Word damn me, I might be a whore, but I'm not a traitor. I don't know anything about a movement like that. I haven't even heard of anyone who dare try and get in the way of the king. But if you spare me, I can feed you the information about a group that I know is starting to gather power in Rifthold. The king is targeting the wrong people? I don't know, but this group, this one he'd probably want to know more about. It seems like they recently learned that the king might be planning some new horror for us all, and they want to try to stop him. Does anybody find it suspicious that he knows of such a group? I can't remember. This is this is one of those things where I don't remember Archer's plotline and what exactly happens. But I do know that reading this, I'm like, I don't know that I would trust him. I feel like some of the things he ends up doing are a little suspicious. I, but, but I can't remember if he's not trustworthy because it's been so long since I read these books. He says there's a group that formed right here in Rifthold and they want to put Aelin Galathinius back on Terrasin's throne. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, this is the first time we're hearing the name Aelin Galathinius. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Her heart stopped beating. 
Aelin Galathinius, the lost heir of Terrison. Aelin Galathinius is dead, she breathed. They don't think so. They say she's alive and that she's raising an army against the king. She's looking to reestablish her court to find what's left of King Orlon's inner circle. She stared at him, willing air into her lungs. If it were true, no, it wasn't true. If these people actually claimed to have met the heir to the throne, then she had to be an imposter. She had to be. Now, how do we think Selena knows that she has to be an imposter? Could it perhaps be because she herself is Aelin Galathinius, the last heir to the throne? Yes, I do think so. But I do think that she does a pretty good job of kind of faking us out here a little bit. So I'm curious to see if anybody reading it for the first time picks up on this and guesses that this is in fact who she is. I mean, there's been enough breadcrumbs of like, this isn't her real name. She's from Terrison. I do feel like you could read this and be like, ooh, wait, what if? Hmm. You know, was it mere coincidence that Nehemia had mentioned Terrison's court this morning? That Terrison was the one force capable of standing against the king? But Nehemia had sworn never to lie to her. So she tells to Archer, you can either fake your own death right now and flee the city before dawn, or I can give you until the end of the month, four weeks, to discreetly get your affairs in order. I assume you have money tied up in Rifthold, but the time comes at a cost. I'll keep you alive only if you can get me information about whatever this Terrace and Rebel movement is, and whatever they know about the King's plans. At the end of the month, you will fake your death, and you will leave the city, go someplace far away, and never use the name Archer Finn again. He says, I'll need the rest of the month to untangle my money, but maybe this is a blessing in disguise. I feel like, why are you giving him a month? I feel like somebody's going to notice something. Is he really going to be able to that discreetly get his affairs in order? Mm. Selena, I have questions. She does, of course, threaten him and say, if I find out that you aren't being discreet, if you draw too much attention to yourself or attempt to flee, I will end you. Is that clear? I am your eternal servant, milady. The thing is, though, is that we know he's smart. He also trained with the assassins. I don't know why she thinks he's trustworthy. Probably because she had a girl to crush on him, I guess. I don't know. I have questions. So she goes home. Kale's like, I thought you were going to stay the whole night. And she's like, hmm. Turns out Archer wasn't as dashing as I remembered. And she explains a little bit of some of the rumors surrounding the lost heir of Terrison, left out the bits about Aelin Galathinius seeking to reestablish her court and raise an army. And she notices a tapestry hanging on the wall in his room of an ancient city nestled into the side of a mountain above a silver lake, Anil, Kaol's home. There's a lot of tapestries in this book, as you'll see, that seem to say important things or play an important role. In this case, we're seeing, you know, Kaol still holds on to his home even after abdicating his title. Kaol still cares about her. They have a moment together. Chapter 12. We have another gown. Philippa has found her a white gown made up of layers of chiffon and silk patterned like overlapping feathers with a matching mask for a masquerade. So she's going to be going with Archer to this masquerade. He promised Arab and Hamel wasn't attending and neither was Lysandra, a courtesan with whom Selena had a long violent history and someone she was fairly certain she'd kill if she ever saw again. First time we see Lysandra on the page, she is going to end up becoming an important character. And uh, this is where her name is first introduced. They're going to a party hosted by Davis, one of his patrons. He's been a client for a few years and he says, I noticed a change in his behavior. He's more paranoid, eats less, and holds up in his office any chance he gets. He's a stocky, middle-aged man. He says, I haven't seen much during my visits, but I think he might be a key leader in this group. One night about two months ago, I was here when three of his friends came over, all of them clients of mine too. It was urgent, they said, and when Davis slipped out of the bedroom, you somehow accidentally overheard everything. So this would also explain if four of his clients are involved in whatever this little group is, that could explain why the king thinks he's involved in some kind of a conspiracy. Aelin is not putting those pieces together though. And also does it not seem suspicious that this many of his clients are doing something and he doesn't know? I think it's suspect, but okay. They spend more time ranting about the king than making plans. I don't think they truly care about Aelin Galathinius. I think they just want to find a ruler who best serves their interests. And maybe they only want her to raise an army so their businesses can thrive during the war that would ensue. 
They want a puppet queen, not a true ruler. She asks, are they even from Terrison? No. Davis's family was years ago, but he spent his whole life in Rifthold. If he claims loyalty to Terrison, it's only a half truth. Maybe they have ancient ties to Terrison, but their reasons are self-serving. And apparently they also have rescued a good number of would-be victims from the king's gallows. They had managed to save one of their informants from being interrogated by the king. And of course, Selena wonders, hmm, <laughs> did Kale know about this? She didn't think torturing and hanging traitors were a part of his duties or were even mentioned to him or Dorian for that matter. But if Kale wasn't in charge of interrogating possible traitors, then who was? Good question. Good question. Also, I, I mean, I don't know that Kale is a great captain of the guard. It's a little weird that he's so unaware. I mean, number one, he's not great. He's not great at his job, let's be honest, and the stuff he does here. Uh, but also, like, I love Kale. I love Kale. But why does the king have him as captain of the guard? It It is a little bit odd. Archer's like, hey, I'm gonna take you to his office. We're gonna pretend we're making out on our way. And then uh, Archer pulls out a lockpick and gets her into the office and is like, hurry up, I'll try to distract them, right? So she looks around, everything looks normal. And then she sees a book with a single word mark written on the spine in blood red ink and is like, what? Titles like this had been burned with the rest of the books on magic. And someone had written a sentence on the inside of the back cover, a riddle. It is only with the eye that one can see rightly. Hmm. Now, I, my note to myself on here was the eye of Elena. Does it go in that hole in that sword or something like that? This is a question that I have. I mean, there's, you know, riddles and she has the eye. Seems possible. Of course, she's like, she prayed the king had never even heard of word marks because of the damage it would do. Good luck with that. <laughs> she memorizes the riddle which isn't too complicated. Fortunes had been broken upon the loss of magic. People who had made their living for years by harnessing its power were suddenly left with nothing. It seemed natural for them to seek out another source of power, even though the king had outlawed it. But, uh-oh, footsteps sounded in the hall and the man himself, Davis, comes into the office. She tries to be like, oh, I'm crying, I'm so sorry. They let me in. His eyes narrow, how did you get in? the housekeeper. Hopefully the poor woman wouldn't be flayed alive after this, except she probably would be, so it kind of sucks. My, my betrothed left me. And so he gives her a handkerchief. So he's like, oh, there's a lady's powder room. And when he gets close to her, he tries to stab her with a knife, but she stops him, but it still slices into her forearm. And he's like, no one has the keys to the study. Not even my housekeeper. What were you looking for? She's like holding him down. And then he laughs at her. Don't you want to know what was on that blade? And realizes the musky smell is Gloriella, a mild poison that caused hours of paralysis. It had been used the night she was captured to knock her down, to make her helpless to fight back as she was handed over to the king's men and thrown into the royal dungeons. Davis's smile termed triumphant. Just enough to knock you out until my guards arrive and bring you to a more private location where she'd be tortured, he didn't need to add. She knew the Gloriella was already racing through her, just as it had on the days after she'd lain beside Sam's broken corpse, smelling the musky smoke still clinging to him. Does anybody think it's weird that Sam's body smelled of Gloriella after she found his corpse? Now, maybe this was just because he was being tortured, but I think that is something to pay attention to. So she ends up killing him and then runs away, manages just barely before the poison totally knocks her out to make it to the outside of Kale's room. And then everything goes black, because of course. And then we have chapter 13. It was one of the longest nights of Kale's life. Every second had passed with horrific clarity, every agonizing second as Selena lay there on the floor of his office, her bodice covered in so much blood, he couldn't tell where she was bleeding. He'd lost it. So he rips open her dress, realizes there were no wounds, and then the panic clears and he remembers that right before she passed out, she had whispered, Gloriella, a poison used to temporarily paralyze victims. So they go get her the antidote, he pieces together what's happening. He was glad Davis was dead because if Davis had survived, Kale would have gone back to finish the job himself. 
because he's gonna take care of Selena. Selena wakes up, doesn't have a lot of memory of what happened, asks if he's gonna tell the king what happened, and he's like, no, because I don't feel like having to argue that you're still capable of spying without getting caught. My men will keep their mouths shut too, but the next time you do anything like this, I'm gonna throw you in the dungeons for killing him, for scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> we have protective kale which i like he says he's burned her dress so there's no proof of what she did lying around chapter 14 selena decides to go back to the library and she's a little bit nervous she hated that the encounter had turned her favorite place in the castle with the encounter with the creature into something unknown and possibly deadly she felt a little foolish as she shoved open the towering oak doors to the library armed to the teeth, most of her weapons concealed. She decides to investigate the library. I actually really love this chapter. I love the investigation of this ancient library with hidden elements to it. That to me is super fun and one of my favorite things in this book. Three levels to the library that she could see with plenty of places to hide on all of them, rooms and alcoves and half crumbling staircases. But what about beneath this level? The library was probably too far away to connect to the tunnels attached to her her rooms, but there could be more forgotten places beneath the castle. Seems likely. Kaol had said something once about a legend regarding a second library underground in catacombs and tunnels. Ooh, well, okay. It seems likely there's something there. So she decides she's going to go looking for this secret library. I've got to say, Sarah in other books also has these kind of big, mysterious, somewhat creepy libraries. We have an example of this in the Akatar series as well. And then we have, you know, this historic library that's talked about that's important in the Crescent City series. I, I like it. I mean, it makes sense for a book nerd, but there's a lot of these really interesting, intriguing libraries, and this is one of them. So she goes searching, she uses chalk to draw an X on a desk so that she can find where she's going, and as she goes farther and farther back, the floor turns from gleaming marble to ancient gray blocks. So clearly she's getting into the older part of the library, but someone must have come down this passageway to light the sconces. So if she became lost, she might not stay that way forever. She continues on and on down the path. Finally, she hits another wall, a corner. The bookcases here were all carved from ancient wood. Their ends shaped into sentries, guards forever protecting the books held between them. It was here that the sconces ran out, and a glance down the back of the library revealed utter darkness. Ooh. Thankfully, one of the scholars had left a torch beside the last sconce. It was small enough it wouldn't burn the whole damn library down, but also too small to last very long. She picks up the torch and heads on. Then we get a quick flash to Dorian waking up with a fierce cold in his bedroom. He'd had a nightmare of teeth and shadows and glinting daggers. He's like, oh, it was just a nightmare. He shook off the last bit of cold. As he turned, he could have sworn he caught a glimpse of a faint ring of frost around where his body had lain on the couch. But when he looked back again, there was nothing there. So we know that there's something, something weird is going on that's probably going to continue. Then we go back to Selena exploring the library. She had been here for three hours. So this is a huge freaking library. Like just think how enormous this library would have to be. I'm not really sure if it even made, but the, the, okay. I, I mean, the, this does seem a little excessive. Like how would you have a library that you're, I don't know. It's fine. The back wall wasn't like the side wall. It dipped and curved and had closets and alcoves and little study rooms full of mice and dust. And just when she'd been about to draw an X on the wall and call it a day, she noticed a tapestry. Cause of course it's another tapestry. These are always where the secret places are. It's the only bit of decoration she'd encountered along the wall. And considering how the last six months of her life had gone, part of her just knew it had to mean something. This tapestry, however, had no depictions of anything interesting. It was just woven from red thread so dark it looked black and it depicted nothing. Weird. So we have a dark red, I mean, how would she tell that it's red and not black? All she has a tor is a torch, I have questions, but a very, very dark red, black looking plain tapestry, interesting. She touches the ancient strands, marveling at the hue so deep it seemed to swallow her fingers in its darkness. I feel like this is important. I cannot remember why, but I feel like 
something about this ends up being important. Of course, she pulls the tapestry aside and a secret door greeted her. Not literally, not like Mort, but there is a secret door there. So she pushes it open, it's not locked, and the light of her torch reached only a few feet inside, illuminating ornately carved walls depicting a battle. There was a thin groove in the marble wall, a channel barely three inches deep that curved along the entire length of the wall, extending beyond the limits of her sight. You pour, you know, flammable liquid into this groove and light it, and it creates some nice ambiance light down the hallway. So very useful. Cobwebs hung from the arched ceiling, grazing over the cobblestone floor. There's rickety bookcases, the shelves crammed full of books so worn Selena couldn't read the titles. Scrolls and pieces of parchment were stuffed in every nook and cranny or lay unrolled on the sagging wood as if someone had just walked away from reading them. Somehow it was more of a tomb than Elena's resting place. Castle records, she keeps going and then she sees another hallway that would lead even lower, another groove in the wall, so she lights this passage. This time, the gray stone depicted a forest, a forest and fae. It was impossible to miss those delicately pointed ears and elongated canines. The fae lounged and danced and played music, content to bask in their immortal and ethereal beauty. She realizes the king must not know about this place because otherwise uh, he would have defaced these carvings with all the magic in the fae. Pay attention to the fact that the high fae have pointed ears and elongated canines. Again, this is going to be important later on in the story. We're getting some information here. Why had Gavin picked the site to build his castle? Had there been something there before or something beneath it worth hiding? Hmm, good question. Breeze wafts up from below and it smells like iron. Interesting. She goes down the spiral staircase and finds a door made entirely of iron. Why was it made entirely of iron? Iron was the one element immune to magic she remembered that much. Most magic gifts had been watered down over the millennia, but for some rare strong ones, when they held on to their power too long, the iron in their blood caused fainting spells or worse. She had seen hundreds of doors in the castle, wood, bronze, glass, but never one of solid iron. So is this supposed to keep someone out or keep something in? Good question. The door is locked. No keyhole is in sight, no sign of rust, was something hidden behind it. She turned away, but the amulet, Elena, the eye of Elena, warmed against her skin and a flicker of light shone through her tunic. Selena paused, studied the slender gap between the door and the stone. A shadow darker than the blackness beyond lingered on the other side. So she takes a flat dagger and lays down on her stomach and basically uses it to catch a reflection to see like reflect light into the room and see if she sees anything. Two gleaming green gold orbs flashed in the shadows beyond. She lunged back, swiping the dagger with her, biting down on her lip to keep from cursing aloud. Eyes, eyes gleaming in the dark, eyes like an, an, <sighs> eyes like an animal, like a rat or a mouse or some feral cat. Yeah, it's probably a rat. Do we think it's a rat? I think not. I think not. Um, it does say, Selena couldn't shake the chill that had wrapped around her or ignore the warmth of the amulet at her neck. Even if there wasn't a creature behind that door, answers lay behind it and she would find them. Just not today, not until she was ready because there might be ways to get through that door. And considering how old this place was, she had a feeling that the power that had sealed it was connected to the word marks. It was a rat. She had no interest, none in being proven wrong right now. She's like, ah, this is a problem for tomorrow. I am not ready to deal with this, but it is a question, what is behind the iron door? We will find out. Chapter 15. Selena goes to dinner in the Great Hall, where the famed Rena Goldsmith is going to be performing during the meal to honor the return of Prince Holland. So we see the royal family there. Selena could hardly see little Prince Holland, but he seemed to be pale, rotund, and blessed with a head full of ebony curls. It seemed rather unfair to put Holland next to Dorian, where comparisons could easily be made. Um, I, I don't love this, like, that the bad kid is rotund, like, I'm glad that children's literature at least is moving 
moving past this a little bit. Interactions with Kaol, Rena Goldsmith floats across the wooden platform, plays the harp, and sings. Selena could hardly see Rena, just enough to tell that she wore a long green dress, no petticoats, no corset, no ornamentation, save for the woven leather belts circling her narrow hips, and her red gold hair was unbound. And when she sang, the whole world faded. Her voice was soft, ethereal, the sound of a lullaby half remembered. She sang all these songs of distant lands, forgotten legends, lovers forever waiting to be reunited, and not a single soul stirred in the hall. Rena looked toward the dais. This song is in honor of the esteemed royal family who invited me here tonight. This song was an ancient legend, an old poem actually, one Selena hadn't heard since childhood and never set to music. The story of a fey woman blessed with a horrible, profound power that was sought by kings and lords in every kingdom. While they used her to win wars and conquer nations, they all feared her and kept their distance. It was a bold song to sing. Dedicating it to the king's family was even bolder, but the royals made no outcry. <laughs> <laughs> at, at this at this moment, Fay woman served kings and lords, and loneliness consumed her bit by bit, and then one day a knight came, seeking her power on behalf of his king. As they traveled to his kingdom, his fear turned to love, and he saw her not for the power she wielded, but for the woman beneath. It was seeing her for who she was, not what, that won her heart. And Selena starts crying and smiles at Kale. Holland is like squirming, saying it's a stupid performance, and Dorian is more staring at Selena and Kale having a moment together than listening to the performance. He says she had never looked at him like that, not once, not even for a heartbeat. He would move on. He deserved someone who would look at him like that, even if the love wouldn't be the same, even if the girl wouldn't be her. He closed his eyes and took another long breath, and when he opened his eyes, he let her go. Good for you, Dorian. <laughs> I've been tired of all of the like longing glances. So I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Don't worry. You will have your own love story. It's going to be great. Just patience. Patience. Then of course, after Rena's song, we have the King of Otterlin dragging Rena Goldsmith forward in his secret torture chamber. She's, he's already beheaded her companion and Parrington and Roland are standing there watching. So they know what's up. He basically is like, do you have any last words? She said she worked for years to be famous enough to come and sing the song so that you would know we're still here, that you may outlaw magic, you may slaughter thousands, but we who keep the old ways still remember. My daughter was 16 when you burned her. Her name was Kayleen and she had eyes like thunderclouds. I can still hear her voice in my dreams. She keeps like saying this litany of people who died um, and then she's ex executed. And that is chapter 15. So regularly reminded of the atrocities that the king has committed. Chapter 16. We've got Selena and Nehemia having breakfast together, and Nehemia is kind of over her work for the king. She says, how can I tell my parents about you? What excuses can I make that will convince them my friendship with the king's champion is in any way an honorable thing? How can I convince them your soul isn't rotted? I didn't realize I needed parental approval. You are in a position of power and knowledge, and yet you just obey. You obey and do not question, and you work toward one goal, your freedom. Selena shook her head and looked away. You turn from me because you know it's true. We know this is not actually what Selena is doing, but Nehemia is like, I don't have the patience for this anymore. Selena can't deal with it anymore, and she decides to tell Nehemia the truth. <laughs> so much for protecting anybody. So she tells her what she's really been doing and Nehemia is like, the king's gonna kill you if he finds out, and asks if she tru trusts Archer. Selena says, I think he values his life more than he values anything else. <laughs> Nehemia says, he's a courtesan. How can you be sure you can trust him? Well, you trust me and I'm an assassin. It's not the same. And, you know, Nehemia is generally the voice of wisdom here, so I suspect that maybe there's a good reason she shouldn't trust Archer. Seems likely. And then Anhemia realizes that Elena is in the, that tapestry and tells her about everything that had gone on with her and Elena, the Ritterac, the secret tomb, all this information, right? And then she takes her to the tomb and introduces her to Mort. I'm gonna be honest, I, I, I find Mort a little irritating. I get that he's supposed to be comic relief, but it's it's a bit much. It's fine. So they go into the tomb. She asks Nehemia to tell her what the word marks on the walls say. Death, eternity, rulers, Nehemia recited, standard tomb posturing. She rubbed her heel against one of the raised stars on the floor, examining the curve that they made across the room. Do they make a constellation? 
Selena rose to her feet and stared down. Nine of the stars made up a familiar pattern, the dragonfly. Her brows rose. She'd never realized it before. <laughs> like, how do you not realize that, like, the stars on the floor probably make up constellations? Again, the same thing happens essentially in, you know, the, the latest book, House of Flame and Shadow. But yeah, of course it's constellations. The dragonfly. And then a few feet away, another constellation lay on the floor, the wyvern. It sat on the head of Gavin's sarcophagus, a symbol of Otterland's house, as well as the second constellation in the sky. Aha! And then she sees the final constellation, the stag, Lord of the North, the symbol of Terrasin, Elena's home country. The constellation faced the wall and its head seemed to be pointed upward as though it were looking at something. It's all, all coming together here. She follows the stag stare up through dozens of word marks that cover the wall until, by the word, look at this, she said pointing, an eye no larger than her palm was etched into the wall. A hole was bored in its center, a perfectly crafted puncture that had been carefully concealed within the eye. She remembers that phrase. It is only with the eye that one can see rightly. There's no way she was that lucky. It was surely no more than a coincidence. She looks, lifts up on her toes to look into the eye. How had she had not noticed this before? She took a step back and the word mark faded into the wall. She stepped back onto the constellation and it appeared again. And Nehemia says, you can only see the face when you stand on the, the stag. So finally she looks through and peers out. All she sees is a distant wall illuminated by a small shaft of moonlight. It's just a blank wall. More, does this make sense? No, don't lie to me. Lie to you? Oh, I couldn't lie to you. You asked whether it makes sense. I said, no, you must learn to ask the right questions before you can receive the right answers. He's <laughs> so annoying. She asks Nehemia if she'll teach her the basics of word marks. Selena wonders, do you think this, it could be this eye, the eye of Elena? No, Nehemia said, it wouldn't be that easy. Or would it? <laughs> I feel like Nehemia saying, no, that's too easy. It feels like a red herring because yes, I think the answer is that easy. If it, I, I'm pretty sure. Trust me, Nehemia says, it's a coincidence. Just like that eye in the wall. The eye could refer to anything, anything at all. Having eyes plastered all over things used to be quite popular centuries ago as a word against evil. You'll drive yourself mad. I can do some research. She didn't want to believe Nehemia, didn't want to think the riddle could be that impossible to solve, but the princess knew far more about ancient lore than she did. I feel like this is kind of a silly way to try to throw the reader off the scent of what is in fact probably a pretty simple solution but okay. She gets a letter from Archer, giving her the names of people who might be involved in the movement, people associated with Davis. She was a little shocked he'd risk putting it all in a letter. Perhaps she needed to teach him a thing or two about code writing. He should know better. This is sketchy as hell. Like, why is he doing this? Something is up. And Nehemia also says, what sort of man just hands out this information like it's nothing more than morning gossip? Selena says, a man who wants his freedom and has had enough of serving pigs. So she trusts him. I think that's a poor choice. But Selena has not had a great history with putting things together. So, okay. Chapter 17. We have some stuff about Holland, who's sulky and privileged and kind of annoying. Kale realizes that Selena has left her guard post to dance with herself. And he's kind of charmed with this when she says, dance with me. And he does. He goes and dances with her. And it's, you know, kind of a nice moment. It says, the rest of the world quieted into nothing. In that moment, after 10 long years, Selena looked at Kaol and realized she was home. It's nice. It's nice. But like, also, I know he's not in game. Meanwhile, of course, of course, Dorian stands at a window and sees them dancing with each other. And then Nehemia comes up next to him. She was resplendent in a cobalt gown with gold thread accents, her hair coiled and braided in a coronet atop her head. Her delicate golden earrings glittered in the light of the chandelier, drawing his eye to her elegant neck. Nehemia was easily the most stunning woman in the ballroom, and he hadn't failed to notice how many men and women had been watching her all night. Don't cause trouble for them, she said quietly. Her accent still thick, but much improved since she'd arrived at Rifthold, except of course we know that that accent is faked because she doesn't want people to expect too much of her. So she says, don't cause trouble for them. We, you and I, we will always stand apart. We'll always have responsibilities. We will always have burdens that no one else can ever understand that they will never understand. And if they did, they would not want them. 
they would not want us, is what you mean. I've already decided to move on, Dorian said with equal quiet. It was the truth. He'd awoken this morning feeling lighter than he had in weeks. Probably a good choice. Nehemia says, then I thank you for that. Your cousin Roland told me that your father has approved Councilman Mullison's plans to swell Kalkul's ranks, to expand the labor camp, to accommodate more. Roland told you that? He wants me to tell my father that I support his agenda to get my father to make the expansion as easy as possible. I refused. She asks him to help stop it, to speak to her father at the council meeting and convince the others to say no. He says, I can't. You can't or you won't. If Selena were shipped to Calcola, would you free her? Would you leave her behind? Innocents work and die in Calcola and Endovir by the thousands. Ask Selena about the graves they dig their prince. Look at the scars on her back and realize that what she went through is a blessing compared to what most endure. If she was sent back, would you free her? Of course I would, he said carefully, but it's complicated. There is nothing complicated. It is the difference between right and wrong. The slaves in those camps have people who love them just as much as you love my friend. Okay, Nehemia, calling people out. I mean, sh she's not wrong. So then this is interesting. She stares at him and says, you have power in you, Prince, more power than you realize. She touched his chest, tracing a symbol there too, and some of the court ladies gasped. But Nehemia's eyes were locked on his. It sleeps, she whispered, tapping his heart. In here, when the time comes, when it awakens, do not be afraid. She removed her hand and gave him a sad smile. When it is time, I will help you. So first indication that we have that Dorian has magic, and we know that Nehemia is able to see people's magic. And so that I think is a really interesting moment. He stares after her, wondering what her last words had meant and why, when she said them, something ancient and slumbering deep inside him had opened an eye. Interesting. Okay, chapter 18, we've got Selena at Archer's townhouse. She's been studying the word marks with Nehemia and struggling with it. Archer says, just give me a moment to freshen up. That won't be necessary. This won't take long. And she's like, I need more than a list of names. I need more information. Give me five weeks. I can't. The king only gave me a month. And he's like trying to bargain for time. Please, a little more time. I don't have any to give you. I need more than names, Archer. What about the crown prince and the captain of the guard? Perhaps they have the information you need. You're close with both of them, aren't you? He says, you think I didn't recognize the captain of the guard the day you just happened to run into me outside of the willow? Have you told them about your plan to keep me alive? No, I haven't. I don't want to involve them. Or is it because you don't actually trust either of them? He's too smart for his own good. And this is where I'm like, Selena, you got to be more careful. He's picking up on so many things and this could be really damaging to her. I don't know. She stalks out and says, you have until the end of the week, six days to get me more information. If you don't give me anything by then, my next visit won't be nearly as pleasant. I feel like this is a bad approach with him, but okay. Then we have Dorian with his dad. His father is smiling at Roland. The black king on the king's hand glinted in the dim light from the beastly fireplace, the mouth-shaped hearth that seemed poised to devour the room. From his spot beside Parrington, Roland gestured to the map. Another black ring glinted on Roland's hand, the same as the one Parrington wore too. Surprise, surprise, Roland is deeply embedded in whatever the king is up to. He's got one of these creepy black rings. What is he going to do with this power? Probably nothing good. So they're talking about wanting to expand Calcola, which is this labor camp to enslave more people and have more workers. And Dorian's like, where are they going to sleep? Will you build shelter for them too? Roland says, they're slaves. Why shelter them when they can sleep in the mines? Then we won't waste time bringing them in and out every day. Yikes. Dorian says, if we have a surplus of slaves, why not let some of them go? Surely they're not all rebels and criminals. Watch your tongue, prince, his father says. He remembers what Nehemia had said to him. He says to his father, you keep tightening the leash. It's going to snap. Looks across to Roland and Mullison. How about you spend a year in Calcola? And when you're done, you two can sit here and tell me about your plans for expansion. His father slammed his hands on the table, rattling the glasses and pitchers. You will mind your mouth, prince, or you will be thrown out of this room before the vote. Nehemia had been right. He hadn't looked at the others in Endovir. He hadn't let himself. I've heard enough, he snarled at his father. You want my vote? Then here it is. No, not in a thousand years. Dorian walks out. He feels this like 
big deep anger and he gets to a forgotten hall and punches the wall and the stone cracks under his hand. Not a small crack, but a spider web that kept growing and growing toward the window on the right until the window exploded, glass showering everywhere as Dorian dropped into a crouch and covered his head. It wasn't possible. Maybe he just hit the wall in the wrong spot? He lowers his hands and looks at them. There wasn't a bruise, a cut, even a trace of pain, but he'd hit that wall as hard as he could. Should have broken his hand, yet his knuckles were unharmed, only white from gripping his fingers in a tight fist. The wall had splintered, but remained intact. The ancient window, however, had shattered completely, and around him, around where he had crouched, a perfect circle, clean of debris, as if the glass and wood had showered everything but him. It wasn't possible, because magic magic. So that magic Nehemia was talking about is awakening in Dorian. This is going to be important. So we have Selena thinking about what Nehemia had said about different courts, wondering if a court like Terrison could rise again. Yes, she thought, yes, Nehemia could rise again if we could find more men like him, like Kaol. But not in the world with this king, she realized. He'd crush a court like that before Nehemia could muster one. If the king were gone, then the court that Nehemia dreamed of could change the world. That court could undo the damage of a decade of brutality and terror. It could restore the lands ravaged by conquest and renew the hearts of the kingdoms that shattered when Otterlin marched in. And in that world, Selena swallowed hard. She and Kaol would never be a normal boy and girl, but perhaps in that world they could make a life of their own. She wanted that life. She wanted that life with him interesting. The world Nehemia dreamed about and the world Selena sometimes dared let herself consider was nothing more than a shred of hope and a memory of what the kingdoms had once been. But perhaps the rebel movement truly knew about the king's plans and how to ruin them, how to destroy him, with or without Aelin Galathinius, and whatever army they claimed she was raising. Very interesting. So she definitely wants something more, but is scared to want too much, but has hope for it. And she's, you know, like falling for Kale. See where that goes. Chapter 19. We have Kale standing before the, the king's throne, reporting, trying not to think about Selena and how much he desires her. The king says, Princess Nehemia needs to be watched. Kale didn't expect that. Her influence is starting to be felt in these halls, and I'm beginning to wonder if perhaps the time has come to remove her back to Ilwe. I know that we already have some men watching her, but I also received word that there was an anonymous threat on her life. Kale stiffened. I hadn't heard anything about that. The king smiled. No one has. Not even the princess herself. It seems she's made some enemies outside the palace as well. He says he'll have extra guards watch her rooms. I'll alert her immediately. There's no need to alert her. Or anyone. The king gave him a pointed look. She might try to use the fact that someone wants her dead as a bargaining chip, might try to make herself into a martyr of sorts, so tell your men to stay quiet. He didn't think Nehemia would do that, but Kale kept his mouth shut. He'd tell his men to be discreet, and he wouldn't tell the princess or Selena. This seems like a bad choice, but okay. We've got Dorian freaking out about possible magic. He's like, no, he must have dreamed it up. Magic had been dormant in the Haviliard bloodline for generations. <laughs> well, maybe not for long. Roland comes up, asks if he can join him in practicing swordplay, and Roland says, ah, oh, yeah, about yesterday, I'm sorry for that. Had I known the labor camps were such a sensitive matter for you, I never would have broached the subject or worked with Counselor Mullison. I called off the vote after you left. Mullison was furious. Dorian raised his brows. Oh? Roland shrugged. You were right. I don't know anything about what it's like in those camps. I only took up the cause because Parrington suggested I work with Mullison, who stood to gain a lot from the expansion because of his ties to the iron industry. And I'm supposed to believe you? Roland gave him a winning smile. We are family, after all. I don't trust... Roland farther than I can throw him, but okay. Roland might be close with Parrington and his father, but perhaps he had just been pulled into Parrington's schemes and needed someone to steer him straight. Maybe it was time for Dorian to play the game too. He could turn his father's pawn against him. Between the two of them, surely they could sway enough of the council to oppose the more unsavory proposals. Good luck with that. He's already got one of those rings. I don't think this is going to work out for you, but Dorian's going to try. 
Roland says, I think you're right that we're pushing our luck with other kingdoms. If we want to keep control, we need to find a balance. Shoving them into slavery won't help. It might just turn more people toward rebellion. Okay. And then uh, there's a big carnival with black tents for Holland that his mother had commissioned. And as soon as I read this, I was like, oh, yes, the witches, the witches are getting introduced here. This is very exciting because they're going to play a big role in this. This is very exciting. It says a stunningly beautiful woman walked out of one of the tents, blonde, slender, tall and dressed in fine riding clothes. And Dorian sees her. Could this person perhaps be important? Yes. Yes, I think so. So there is words written in paint on the side of the wagon. The carnival of mirrors. See illusions and realities collide. He frowned. Had his mother even put a moment's consideration into the gift, into how it might appear, what message it would send? Carnivals, with their illusions and tricks, always pushed the limit of outright treason. Uh, Dorian snorted. Perhaps he belonged in one of those cages. So Kaol finds him, and then Selena finds them, and is like, what are you doing here so early then? Veiling's not until nightfall. They walk around, they see a beautiful blonde woman perched on a stool beginning to play a lute. And they, you know, are interested in looking around. Welcome, welcome, shouted an old woman, bent and gnarled with age, from a podium at the foot of its stairs. A crown of stars adorned her silver hair, and though her tanned face was saggy and speckled, there was a spark in her brown eyes. Look into my mirrors and see the future. Let me examine your palms so I might tell you myself. Care to have your fortune told, girl? Dorian blinked, then blinked again at the sight of the woman's teeth. They were razor sharp, like a fish's, and made of metal of iron. She's a witch. She's one of the witches. Uh, this is going to be important. Dorian had heard the legends of the fallen witch kingdom where bloodthirsty witches had overthrown the peaceful Kraken dynasty and then ripped apart the kingdom stone by stone. 500 years later, songs were still sung of the deadly wars that had left the Iron Teeth clans, the only ones standing on the killing field dead Kraken queens all around them, but the last Kraken queen had cast a spell to ensure that as long as Iron Teeth banners flew, no bit of soil would yield life to them. This background is very important for later on in the book, the, the curse and the Iron Teeth versus the Krakens and how that curse could be broken. That's going to be very important. So this w old woman says, come into my wagon, dear heart. Let old Baba Yellowlegs take a look into your future. Sure enough, peeking out from beneath her brown robe were saffron-colored angles. So Dorian's like, this is probably a sham. That woman had probably put on a fake set of iron teeth and sheer yellow stockings and called herself Baba Yellowlegs to make carnival patrons hand over good coin. You're a witch, Selena said, her voice strangled. She didn't think it was a sham, apparently. No, her face still white as death. Gods, was she actually scared? Baba Yellowlegs laughed, a crow's cackle, and bowed. The last-born witch in the witch kingdom. Care to have your fortune read now? No, Selena says. Then get out of my way and let me go about my business. I've never seen such a cheap crowd. Kaol is like, don't be so rude to your customers. And what would a man who smells of the Silver Lake do to an innocent old witch like me? Selena's like, let's go, let's go. The witch was grinning at him, and she used a long metallic nail to pick something from her teeth. Hide from fate all you like, Baba Yellowlegs said as they turned away, but it shall soon find you. Well... For both Selena and Dorian, that is definitely the case. Selena's kind of freaking out. Seeing that woman, feeling the sense of otherness that radiated from her, Selena had no trouble believing that these witches were capable of consuming a human child until nothing but clean picked bones remained, one of the rumors. While she'd been standing in front of that wagon, all she'd wanted for some reason was to get inside it. Like there was something waiting for her within, and that crown of stars the witch had been wearing. And then her amulet had started feeling heavy and warm the way it had the night she'd seen that person in the hall. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe she'd come back with Nahimi and see if she really was who she said she was. Because it was almost Kale's birthday, Dorian gives him as a gift a night black Asterian stallion with ancient dark eyes. This stallion is going to end up being important. Kale's like, this is a gift for a prince, not nonsense. I'll be offended if you don't accept. Selena says, I had an Asterion mare once. Her name was Cassida. She smiled at the memory. It meant drinker of the wind in the dialect of the Red Desert. She looked like a storm-tossed sea. How did you get an Asterion mare? They're worth even more than the stallions, Dorian said. I stole her from the Lord of Xandria. 
I swear on the word it's the truth I'll tell you the story some other time we will be finding out more about that I think in the Assassin's Blade so take note of that Selena and Kale have plans for Kale's birthday Dorian's like well I hope you have fun. Selena notices that those words that Bobby Yellowleg said about fate were very similar to what Mort had said on the night of the eclipse. Hmm, interesting. So then she starts to wonder, maybe Nehemia's wrong. Maybe the Eye of Elena is the eye in the riddle. She decides she's tired of waiting for her friend to research it. She'd go back just once and never tell Nehemia because the hole in the wall was shaped like an eye, its iris removed to form a space that would perfectly fit the amulet she wore around her neck. I don't know why Nehemia would say don't do it or that it, that's not the answer. I mean, it, it seems kind of obvious. Chapter 20, Selena heads to the tomb talks to Mort, asks this necklace, does it truly have power? Of course it does, but it's thousands of years old, so it's magic. Magical things rarely age as normal objects do. I mean, people included. <laughs> That's gonna be important, right? But what does it do? It protects you, as Elena said. It guards you from harm, though you certainly seem to do your best to get into trouble. I think I know what it does. Perhaps it was mere coincidence, but the riddle had been worded so specifically. You're probably wrong, Mort said. I'm just warning you. She tries it out. It fits, sort of, and she peers through the gold bands and doesn't see anything. And she's like, ah, but it's the eye of Elena. It's only with the eye that one can see rightly. What other eye is there? You could rip your own out and see if it fits, Mort says. And then she again notices, ah, time's rift is what is engraved on Elena's feet. We're going to keep being reminded of this because it's going to be important later. She says that nothing happens. Mort cackles. She snatched the amulet out of the wall. Ugh, I hate this. I hate this stupid tomb and I hate these stupid riddles and mysteries. Fine, fine. Nehemia was right. The amulet was a dead end. Or is it? I told you it wouldn't work. Then what will work? That riddle does reference something in this tomb behind that wall, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But you still haven't asked the proper questions. I've asked you dozens of questions and you won't give me any answers. She, I mean, she's like kind of whiny. <laughs> be honest but okay so then she has a dream that she's standing on the barren edge of a ravine and on the grassy lip of the other side stands a white stag watching her with ancient eyes his massive antlers glowed in the moonlight wreathing him in ivory glory just as she remembered it had been on a chill night like this that she'd spotted him through the bars of her prison wagon on the way to endovier a glimmer of a world before it was burned to ash again we have the white stag which is the symbol of terracin Clearly she's the heir of Terrison. There are lots of indications that this is the case. So in her dream, the stag comes closer, his head is angled as if inviting her to join him, but the ravine only seemed to grow wider, like the maw of a giant beast opening to devour the world. So Selena did not cross, and the stag turned away, his steps near silent, as he disappeared between the tangled trees of the ageless wood. Selena wakes up remembering when she woke up in the blood of her parents. And so then Kaol is wondering where she is when she doesn't meet him for her run, goes to ask Nehemia if she knows where she is. And Nehemia says, she's taken the day off. If I were to guess, I'd say she's as far away from the city as she can get in half a day's ride. So Kaol wonders why she's taken off. And Nehemia says, because today is the 10th anniversary of her parents' death. No wonder she had a nightmare the night before. So that is where we're at. Uh, plot is thickening. I mean, it's moderately interesting. I'm kind of glad Dorian has given up on her because I was, it was getting a little old, the jealousy. So interested to see where things go in the next 10 chapters. Once I have read them, I will touch base again. All right, I am back to talk about the next nine chapters. Yes, nine, because that is where we get into part two of the book. So it seemed like a good place to stop. We'll start in chapter 21. I'll continue to say this is not my favorite of the series. And also the end of this section is where a thing that I hate happens. So let's get into chapter 21. So Kaol and Nehemia are talking and Kaol realizes that Selena was only eight when her parents had died and everything happened and he asks if she told Nehemia she says no she didn't tell me but I know she watched him with a calculated stillness my question at this point was does she know who Selena is I think we have indications that she probably does know her real identity and we're gonna get two more of them I think it's pretty likely we find out that the day that Selena had snapped in the mines of Endovier and killed a bunch of people was also the anniversary of her parents 
death. We get like a flashback to what she did. It feels really unnecessary to the narrative <laughs> of like going all the way back to the salt mines of Endovia and showing us what she did. I don't know why we really need that. In this part of the book we're also getting this further development of a romance between Selena and Kale. So Dorian has kind of given up on her. Things are starting to move forward. So he gets her chocolate cake when she gets back after this and says I thought you might need some. For you I'd say chocolate cake is definitely a need and she hugs him and they're kind of getting closer. Chapter 22 we have Dorian in the library which we know there's weird stuff happening there. The silence of the library wrapped around Dorian like a heavy blanket. He read through his family's extensive genealogical charts, records, and histories. He couldn't be the only one. If he truly did have magic then what about Holland? He'd have to figure out how to suppress it and teach Holland to do the same so that their dad didn't kill them is what he's concerned about. How would the people that he that his dad had oppressed would react if they knew that the heir to the throne was plagued by the same powers that had been outlawed. Dorian ran a finger down his mother's family tree. It was dotted with Havilliards along the way, a close mingling of their two families from the past few centuries that had given rise to numerous kings. But none of the books held any mention of magic wielders. In fact, there had been a drought in the line for centuries. Several gifted people had married into the bloodline, but their children hadn't been born with the power, no matter what manner of gifts the parents possessed. On the top of the family tree was Gavin Havilliard, the mortal prince who had taken his warband into the depths of the Rune Mountains to challenge the Dark Lord Erewhon. Only a third of the men who had ridden in with Gavin came out of the mountains, but Gavin also emerged from that war with his bride, the Princess Elena, the half fay daughter of Brandon, Terrison's first king. It was Brandon himself who gave Gavin the territory of Otterland as a wedding gift, and a reward for the prince and princess's sacrifices during the war, and since then no fay blood had been bred into their line. So we're getting a lot of history history here of who's who, how Elena is tied into all of this since her ghost is here and how she's related to Dorian as like a many times great grandmother. If Elena had gifted the line with her power then perhaps the answers could be found elsewhere because Elena was originally from the Galathinius line, so he finds a history of the Galathinius line starting with the fey king Brannon himself. He'd known the line was blessed with magic, but this, it was a powerhouse. A bloodline so mighty that other kingdoms had lived in terror of the day the lords of Terrison would come to claim their lands. But they never had. While they'd been gifted, they didn't push their borders. When foreign kings threatened them, retribution was swift and brutal, but no matter what, they kept to their borders, kept the peace. As my father should have done, he thinks. Yeah, well, he clearly did not. In the book he held, no one had bothered to mark the houses his fathers had exterminated or the survivors sent into exile. What sort of throne would he inherit someday? If the heir of Terrison, Aelin Galathinius, had lived, would she have become a friend? An ally? His bride, perhaps? <laughs> and of course, as we all know, he does in fact know the heir. Aelin Galathinius under a different name. He'd met her once in the days before her kingdom became a charnel house. The memory was hazy, but she'd been a precocious, wild girl who had set her nasty brutish older cousin on him in order to teach Dorian a lesson for spilling tea on her dress. But her cousin, and this is important, and wound up becoming Adion a Shriver, his father's prodigy general and the fiercest warrior in the north. He'd met him a few times over the years, and each encounter with the haughty young general, he'd gotten the distinct impression that Adion wanted to kill him. So this is really important, right? That Selena cousin is the general of the king's armies. Wonder how that's gonna go down eventually. He wonders if Nehemia understands what's inside of him. Then the temperature in the library drops. A frozen draft blows in from a distant corridor. We know something weird is going on. He gets really angry. He's like he could let it go. He had let it go. He'd let it go. Let go. Let. Books flew from their shelves, dozens upon dozens bursting into flight, and this time they slammed into him as he staggered back toward the end of the row. There was some force running through him, begging him to unleash it again, to open himself up. So he leaves the library. He could trust no one. The witch at the carnival, she hadn't recognized him as the prince. Still, her gift had rung true, at least when talking to Kaol. It was a risk, 
but perhaps Baba Yellowlegs had the answers he needed. So he's gonna go talk to her, see if he can get some answers about his magic, since he's not finding anything in the library. It's Kaol's birthday, and so Selena surprises him by taking him to this secret greenhouse on the roof of an apothecary, where she set up this lovely special dinner with his favorite meals. It's very romantic, very sweet. He's like, no one has ever done this for me etc. They have chocolate hazelnut cake and sparkling wine. And it says she'd meant the dinner to be a nice surprise, a way to tell him how much she appreciated him. But his reaction, how long had it been since he felt cherished? Did his parents have any idea that in the entire castle, in the entire kingdom, there was no one more loyal and noble than him? That the boy they'd thrown out of their lives had become the sort of man that kings and queens could only dream of having serve in their courts? The sort of man she hadn't believed existed, not after Sam, not after everything that had happened. I have to tell you something, she said softly. I haven't killed any of the people the king commanded me to assassinate. Oh, she says, you have to promise me not to freak out first. Um, but she's like, the only person I've actually killed is Davis and he wasn't an official target. I'm gonna have Archer fake his death. Kale's face was bone white. He backed away, shaking his head. You've gone mad. Which, f fair. I mean, he is understandably scared for her safety. I don't know why Selena's all of a sudden like, I'm gonna just tell people things now, I guess. <laughs> it's like once that, once that was uncorked, it's just coming out to everybody, even the captain of the guard. Chapter 23, he's pissed off. If you lost your senses, he'll kill you. He will kill you if he finds out. He won't find out. It's only a matter of time. He has spies watching everything. Those men are traitors to the crown. Traitors for refusing to grovel before a conqueror, for sheltering escaped slaves trying to get home, for daring to believe in a world that's better than this God's forsaken place. I will not be his butcher. And he's like, you swore an oath to him. How many oaths did he swear that he broke to foreign rulers and destroyed things? And he's like, he will kill you. He'll kill you and make me do it as punishment for being your friend. And clearly he's understandably afraid. And she says, listen, Archer's been giving me information. I don't care. <laughs> what information could he have that could help you? But the secret movement from Terrison actually exists. I could use this information that I've gathered. Where will you go if he finds out anywhere as far away as I can get? And what would you do? Live my life, I suppose. Live it the way I want to for once. Learn how to be a normal girl. How far away? I'd travel until I found a place where they'd never heard of Otterland, if such a place exists. And this I think is cute. Because she was young and so damn clever and amusing and wonderful, wherever she made her home, there would be some man who would fall in love with her and would make her his wife. And that was the worst truth of all. It snuck up on him, this pain and terror and rage at the thought of anyone else with her. I do like the fact that he's falling for her, but it's not just about her looks. It's about all these other things that he loves about her. And I like that. And he says, we'll find that place then. I'll go with you. Ooh, okay. What about being captain of the guard? Perhaps my duties aren't what I expected them to be. The king kept things from him. There were so many secrets and perhaps he was little more than a puppet, part of the illusion he was starting to see through. So, somebody had said this definitely in the Discord server. He's not a very good captain of the guard. He's not, like he's not great at his job, but I do love him. And he's like, I would be the greatest fool in the world to let you go alone. You remind me of the, what the world can be. And then he kisses her. The kiss obliterated her. It was like coming home or being born or suddenly finding an entire half of herself that had been missing. And then they go back to her room and, and she, they sleep together basically. And he's like, are you sure? She had waited once before, waited with Sam and then it had been too late. But now there was no doubt, no shred of fear or uncertainty as if every moment between her and Kale had been a step in a dance that had led to this threshold. I've never been so sure of anything in my life, she told him. And then it's it's like a very vague thing. They kiss and then it says there was only them skin against skin and when they reached that moment when there was nothing more between them at all, Selena kissed Kale deeply and gave him everything she had. So I, you know this is, I actually had forgotten that they sleep together in this book, but it's very vague. It's not giving any specifics that we do get later on in the series, but we know that she's 18 years old so it's not, you know, I think it's fine. One thing that I actually really like though about what Sarah did with this is that we know if we've read the series that Kale is not endgame for her. He is not who she ends up with but 
he is the first person that she is with in this way. He is somebody that she loves deeply and they have this really beautiful relationship together. Consent is prioritized here. Like there is enthusiastic consent. And even though he's not who she ends up with, it's a positive relationship in her life that is moving her towards the person she needs to be to be with the person she ends up with and for him too, that the both of them are growing through this experience. And I actually really like that in a YA book that the first person she falls for isn't the person she ends up with and I don't think that I'd realized that was something that she did before in this way um and I think it's I think it's great we have the morning you know the next morning she's tired but happy and realizes she needs to talk to Philippa about a contraceptive tonic as soon as she drags herself out of bed because God's above a baby and I like that too some discussion of magical contraception and that that's something to think about he's like I don't want you to think I'm agreeing to keep this a secret because I'm ashamed in any way. Who said anything about shame? Honestly, I'm surprised you're not strutting about boasting to everyone. I certainly would be if I'd tumbled me. <laughs> Does your love for yourself know no bounds? Absolutely none. We can't tell Dorian. He'll figure it out, I bet. But I don't think we should tell him outright. That is that chapter. Chapter 24, we have Dorian going to the black tents of the carnival to go and look for Baba Yellowlegs. And she's eating, says carnival's closed for lunch. Customers who have questions during lunch pay double. He gives her gold coins and says, I hope this will buy me all the questions I want and your discretion. So she agrees and he's like, you're truly a witch, the last born witch of the witch kingdom. That would make you over 500 years old. It's a marvel I've stayed so young, isn't it? So it's true. Witches really are blessed with the long lifespans of the Fae. Fae or Valg, we never learned which one. Valg. Hmm, this is the first time we're hearing of this word here, and it's important. The demons who stole Fae to breed with them, which made the witches, right? And if he recalled correctly, the beautiful Crokin witches had taken after their fey ancestors, while the three clans of Iron Teeth witches took after the race of demons that had invaded Aurelia at the dawn of time. So one question is whether the Valg are the same as the Asteri from the Crescent City series. I think it is very possible they did do some crossbreeding. It seems likely that there is a connection here, but this is the first time we're hearing of the Valg, so that's going to be very important for later on in the series. And, uh, you know, misconceptions and ideas about the different witch clans is also going to be explored further. Is magic truly gone? Your kind of magic is gone, yes, but there are other forgotten powers that work. What sorts of powers? Powers that lordlings have no business knowing. Now ask your next question. So he says, could one person somehow have magic? Boy, I've traveled from one shore of this continent to the other across every mountain into the dark, shadowy places where men still fear to the tr tread. There is no magic left anymore. Even the surviving fae can't access their powers. Some of them remain trapped in their animal forms. Miserable wretches. Taste like animals, too. Okay, so this is also important, right? There's not magic left that even some of the fae have been trapped in animal forms. This is the first time we're finding out, right? Some of them can shift into animals and they haven't been able to access their magic. What if somebody discovered they suddenly had magic? They'd be a fool in asking for a hanging. But if it were true, hypothetically, like, you know, just hypothetically, of course, how would that even be possible? We don't know how or why magic vanished. I hear rumors every now and then that the power still exists on other continents, but not here. Why did magic vanish only here and not across the whole of Aurelia? What crimes did we commit to make the gods curse us like that? Hypothetically, if someone had magic and I wanted to learn why, I'd start by figuring out why magic left in the first place. Maybe that would explain how there could be an exception to the rule. She says the gods that cursed these da lands 10 years ago damned the witches centuries before that. And it says he saw a darkness gleaming in her eyes, a darkness that made him wonder if she was even older than she let on. Perhaps her last born witch title was a lie to conceal a history so violent he couldn't imagine the horrors she'd committed during those long ago witch wars. Who knows, really, at this point? So she leaves and then he sees Roland walking towards him. He'd been there talking and Dorian's like, is he following me? What's up? That's weird. And he's like, oh, I was bored. I saw you heading out here and thought you might want company. But then I saw where you were going and decided to keep well away. Either Roland was spying on him or he was telling the truth. Dorian honestly couldn't tell, 
but he'd made a point to be pleasant to his cousin during the past few days, and at every council meeting Roland had backed whatever decision Dorian made without hesitation. The irritation on Parrington and his father's faces was an unexpected delight, too. So Dorian didn't question Roland about why he'd followed him, but when he glanced back at Baba Yellowlegs, he could have sworn the old woman was grinning at him. Definitely don't trust Roland. I feel like there's a lot of people in this book kind of trusting people they shouldn't, and we're gonna get more into that. So Selena realizes that all the men on her list that Archer gave her, leaving town quietly in the middle of the night with all of their families. Archer shows up and is like, I'm sorry, I had to warn them. I couldn't live with their blood on my hands. <laughs> they have children. What would become of them if you handed over the parents to the king? Why does she trust him? Like, I like this is what's okay. What's really wild to me is that even after this whole conversation, she still trusts him. Like, what the hell, Selena? You know, more of Selena making bad choices. Oh, I didn't organize this. A member of the organization did. I mentioned that their lives might be in jeopardy and he had his men get them on the next ship out of Rifthold. I'm like, how do you know the person this high up in this organization if you're not involved in it? Hmm, does Selena ask that question? No, she's really bad at this kind of stuff. She was in book one, she is here too. And uh, he's like, no, this won't happen again. She highly doubted that. <laughs> but she's basically just like, um, the person you mentioned this to, he's a leader of the group? I think so. Or high up enough that when I dropped the hint about these men, he was able to organize an escape immediately. And she says, I want new names and more information by tomorrow night. Tell me why. Okay. Okay, Selena. <laughs> says, while it was absurd they claimed to have contact with Aelin Galathinius, she couldn't help but wonder if there really were forces gathering in the heir's name. If somewhere in the past decade, members of the powerful royal court of Terrison had managed to hide. Terrison no longer had a standing army, but those men did have some resources. And as Nehemia had said, if Terrison ever got to its feet again, it would pose a real threat to Otterlin. Just maybe, whatever their motives, these people could find a way to stop the king and free all of Aurelia as well. And she's hoping she doesn't have to be part of it. Good luck with that. So she's going back to meet up with Kaol. And then we find out that in the four days since Kaol's birthday, he had spent every night since then with Selena and afternoons and mornings, and every moment they could spare from their individual obligations, hooking up, basically. Uh, is this a stupid thing to do? When he's captain of the guard and they're both watched and notorious, yes, but it's, it's still what they're doing. So he's meeting with the guards and distracted because he's thinking about Selena, and they're like, do we need extra guards at the carnival? Hell, he didn't even know why they were asking that. Had there been some incident? If he asked, they'd definitely know he hadn't been listening. Then Selena's like, Captain, the king wants to see you. Of course, he he doesn't. She just wants to get it on with him. So they go into a broom closet because they only have a few minutes. I'm like, y'all, this is, you're gonna get in trouble for this, but good luck. All right. Then we have Selena and Nehemia like chit-chatting a broom closet. Nehemia said, grinning like a fiend. Really? Like gossiping about whatever. And Selena's like, who knew I'd been missing out on such fun? So she's, you know, been enjoying time with that. I could have told you that, Nehemia said, reaching over Selena to grab a chocolate from the dish on the nightstand. Though I think the real question is, who would have guessed that the solemn captain of the guard could be so passionate? I'm happy for you, my friend. I think I'm happy for me too. But then she sees a shift in Nehemia and Nehemia's like, the king has asked me to speak to the rebel forces to convince them to back down or else he'll butcher them all. The threat was implied. At the end of the month, he's sending Parrington to the Duke's keep in Morath. Selena's like, are you going back to Eelway? And Nehemia says, I don't know. I need to be here. There are, there are things that I need to do here in this castle and in the city, but I cannot abandon my people to another massacre. What things, pray tell Nehemia? What, what things do you need to do? Will we find out? Yes, we will. She says, I've grown up knowing the weight of my crown. When the king invaded Eelway all those years ago, I knew I would someday have to make choices that would haunt me. Selena's like, no wonder Nehemia had been so slow about looking into the eye riddle. Or she doesn't want to. I think maybe the answer is she doesn't want to. And Nehemia's like, promise me. Promise me you'll help me free Eelway from him. Free Eelway? Promise me you'll see my father's crown restored to him. That you'll see my people returned from Endovir and Kalakulla. I'm just an assassin. And the kind of thing you're talking about, Nehemia, that would be madness. There's no other way. Ilway must be freed. And with you helping me, we could start to gather a host to... No. No. 
Not for all the world would I help you muster an army against him. Iowe has been hit hard by the king, but you barely got a taste of the kind of brutality he unleashed elsewhere. You raise a force against him and he'll butcher you. I won't be a part of that. So what will you be a part of, Selena? What will you stand for? Or will you only stand for yourself? So I think Nehemia knows what's going on. The thing that I don't like about the way that this ends up being handled is that we have a moment where we know that Selena, to grow and become who she needs to be, has to get forced onto this path of being willing to fight the king when she's currently not willing to. The way she gets pushed to do that isn't great. Isn't great. So we'll get there. And he destroyed my entire kingdom literally hers since she was the heir to it and she, and Nehemia is like upset she's like when will you say enough Selena what will make you stop running and face what is before you if Endovir and the play of my people cannot move you what will I am one person one person chosen by Queen Elena one person whose brow burned with a sacred mark on the day of that duel one person who despite the odds is still breathing our paths crossed for a reason if you are not God's blessed then who is and Selena's like this is ridiculous this is folly. Folly? Folly is to fight for what is right, for people who cannot stand up for themselves? You think soldiers are the worst he can send? There are far darker things gathering on the horizon. My dreams have been filled with shadows and wings, the booming of wings soaring between mountain passes, and every scout and spy we send into the White Fang Mountains, into the Farian Gap, does not come back. And in the valley, people say they can hear wings too, riding the winds through the gap. I don't understand a word you're saying. But Selena had seen that thing outside the library. She doesn't want to see what Nehemia is saying. She doesn't want to see that there's something worse coming. And this is giving us an indication of what's to come. Nehemia says, you do understand. When you look at him, you sense there is a greater twisted power around him. How did such a man conquer so much of the continent so quickly? With military might alone? How did the most powerful court in the world get wiped out in a matter of days? You're tired and upset. Selena said as calmly as she could, trying not to think of how similar Nehemia and Elena's words were. Maybe we should talk about this later. I don't want to talk about this later. If we do not strike now, then whatever he is brewing will only grow more powerful, and then we will be beyond any chance of hope. There is no hope, Selena said. There is no hope in standing against him. Not now, not ever. And I will not be a part of whatever plan you have. I will not help you get yourself killed and bring down even more innocent people in the process. You will not help because all you care about is yourself. And so what if I do? So what if I want to spend the rest of my life in peace? There can never be any peace, not while he reigns. When you said you weren't killing the men on his list, I thought you were finally taking a step toward making a stand. I thought that when the time came, I could count on you to help me start planning. I didn't realize you were doing it just to keep your own conscience clean. I didn't realize you're just a coward. And Selena is like, when your people are lying dead around you, don't come crying to me. Whew. So we have like quite the conflict here. I just think... Yeah, like I understand Nehemia's frustration. I also understand why Selena thinks that it's hopeless and there's nothing to be done, but I, I don't like the way that this is handled. Chapter 25 is very short. We get this side scene between two characters named the Queen and the Princess. I think it is pretty clear that the people who are talking are Elena and Nehemia, and this is the start of the thing that I have some issues with. One of them has to break the queen said to the princess, only then can it begin. I know, the princess said softly, but the prince isn't ready. It has to be her, her meaning Selena. Then do you understand what I'm asking of you? Yes. Then do what needs to be done. The princess nodded and walked out of the tomb and then turned back to the queen. She won't understand. And when she goes over the edge, there will be nothing to pull her back. She will find her way back. She always does. For all our sakes, I hope you're right. Chapter 26, Kaol is off on a hunting party, which he hates. He's, you know, wondering about his 
younger brother who hasn't seen in years. Had his father allowed Terran to turn into one of these idiots, or had his father sent him to train as a warrior, as all lords of Anil had done in the centuries after the wild mountain men had preyed upon the city on the Silver Lake? We get like snippets of his backstory, which eventually will be somewhat important. This is interesting though. Kaol allowed himself to consider for one heartbeat what his father would make of Selena. His mother was a gentle, quiet woman, and even though their marriage had been arranged, his father had wanted someone like his mother, someone submissive, which meant that someone like Selena, he cringed to even consider his father and Selena in a room together, cringed and then smiled, because that was a battle of wills that could go down in legend. I like this. I love the fact that Kaol likes Selena for who she is and what doesn't want her to be anything different. I think that's great. The king comes over to Kale and says, I'm having the princess of Ilwe, Nehemia, questioned in my council room tomorrow night. I want six men outside the room. Make sure there are no complications or interruptions. The king makes it clear he doesn't want Selena to get involved. Dorian and Kale have a moment together and Dorian is like, treat her well. Clearly he's realized that him and Selena have gotten together. That's kind of the end of the hunt. And then Kale didn't tell Selena what the king had said, though part of him twisted until it hurt. So this is going to be a problem, right? The king wouldn't hurt Nehemia, not when she was such a public and well-liked figure, not when he'd warned Kaol about that anonymous threat to Nehemia's life, but he had a feeling that whatever was going to be said in the council room wasn't going to be pleasant. Selena knowing or not knowing made no difference, he told himself as he lay curled around her in his bed. Even if Selena knew, even if she told Nehemia, it wouldn't stop the conversation from taking place and it wouldn't make the nameless threat go away. It would just make things worse if they knew, worse for all of them. This is going to end up being a problem, right? I, and I made this note even when I was re reading this, that this is a thing where Selena and Kaol have this great romance that's developing, but him choosing not to tell her the, and keeping this a secret is going to end up being viewed as a betrayal. And so, of course, you got to throw a wrench in things. We can't just have things be happy that easily. And also the fact that he trusts the king to not hurt her you don't know him as well as you think you do, right? I think what twists the knife in here is that Kale gets up and Selena's still sleeping. That was a miracle in itself, he realized, that she felt safe enough to sleep soundly with him, right? She really trusts him and he is doing something that is going to betray that trust. Perhaps it was a test, he thought. Perhaps the king was testing Kale to see where his loyalties lay, if he could still trust him. And if he learned that Selena and Nehemia were aware of the interrogation tomorrow, then there would be only one way for them to have learned. So he's making excuses to himself, this is going to be a problem. He goes out to get some fresh air, you know, starting to imagine the glimmer of a future, how it would be to forge a life together, to call her his wife, to hear her call him husband, to raise a brood of children who would probably be far too clever and talented for their own good, and for Kale's sanity. He was still envisioning that impossibly beautiful future when someone grabbed him from behind and pressed something cold and reeking against his nose and mouth and the world went black. So, of course, we have this moment. He makes a choice that's not great, leaves Selena, and everything's about to change. Chapter 27. Kale's not in bed when she wakes up and Selena's like, oh, it's fine. He's probably busy. She doesn't see him for a while, but she's like, I'm sure he has things going on. Over breakfast, a list of names arrived from Archer, written in code as she'd asked with more men to hunt down. She hoped he wouldn't squeal on her again. Um, like, why are you trusting him? Mm. Nehemia didn't show up for their daily lesson on the word marks, though Selena wasn't surprised by that either because they'd had that fight. Then Kaol didn't show up for dinner and she starts to freak out. So she starts running. She was remembering what happened to Sam. She's running to find Kaol and realizes that when they'd taken Sam from her, it hadn't been because of anything Sam had done. No, they'd done it to get at her. And she realizes they might take Kaol for the same reason. She opens the door to his bedroom and sees a sealed note addressed to her on the table beside the door, placed atop his sword, which hadn't been there this morning. She ripped open the red seal and unfolded the paper. We have the captain. When you're tired of stalking us, come find her. It listed the address for a warehouse in the slums of the city. Stalking us. Clearly she shouldn't have trusted Archer. He's getting her into more trouble. 
Bring no one or the captain will die before you set foot in the building. If you fail to arrive by tomorrow morning, we'll leave what's left of him on the banks of the Avery. An icy, endless rage swept through her, wiping away everything except the plan she could see with brutal clarity. The killing calm, Arabin Hamill had once called it. Even he had never realized just how calm she could get when she went over the edge. If they wanted Otterlin's assassin, they'd get her, and word help them when she arrived. Whew. Okay, so then we have Kaol. He's in this warehouse. He doesn't know who's got him. They're wearing long robes and hoods that conceal their masked faces. Some of them are armed. They speak in murmurs, growing increasingly on edge as the day passed. They were waiting for something, he realized. They've also split his lip and kind of beaten him up a little bit, but nothing too serious. Somebody says, she has until dawn. She'll show up. That word was the worst thing he'd ever heard, because there was only one she who would bother to show up for him. One she that he could be used against. You hurt her, and I'll rip you apart with my bare hands. You so much as touch her, and I'll gut you. Good luck with that, the man said. You better pray to whatever gods you favor that your little assassin cooperates. What do you want from her? None of your business, Captain. And keep your mouth shut when she arrives, or else I'll cut out your filthy royal tongue. Another clue. The man hated royals, which meant these people... Had Archer known how dangerous this rebel group was? Yanks on his chains, tries to get free, and then this man is like, do that and I'll knock you out again. For the captain of the Royal Guard, you were far too easy to capture. Which is true. He's not great at his job. He realizes he's not an uneducated warrior, someone with schooling because of the vocabulary. I don't think you realize who you're dealing with. And the man says, if you were that good, you would be more than just captain of the guard. Kaol let out a slow, breathy laugh. I wasn't talking about me. She's just one girl. Then you're really in for a surprise. I love this. Again, I love his faith in her that he knows she's a badass and they're in trouble. Chapter 28, Selena is is armed to the teeth and she is going. They told her to arrive alone and she'd obeyed, but they hadn't said anything about arriving unarmed. So she'd taken every weapon she could fit on her, including Kale's sword. They hadn't said anything about using the front door of the warehouse either. So she's coming through the rooftop. When they had taken Kale, they had made the biggest mistake of their lives. She gets to the place. Ten of the men were heavily armed and six archers were positioned around the wooden mezzanine, arrows all pointed at the first floor below. There was Kale, chained to one of the wooden walls. His face bruised and bleeding, his clothes ripped and dirty, his head hanging between his shoulders. The ice in her gut spread through her veins. So she's like, I'm coming in hot. It's like this time she wouldn't fail. The men weren't even looking at the window when she hurtled through. And by the time she landed on the mezzanine and rolled into a crouch, two of her daggers were already flying. Kaol caught the glint of moonlight on steel in the heartbeat before she leapt through the second level window, landing atop the mezzanine and hurling two daggers at the archers nearest to her. They went down and she went up, two more daggers thrown at two more archers. I feel like the, I put a wrote so satisfying that she comes to save him. I kind of love that. I do, I do, like there are parts of this book that I really like. I think this is a really satisfying scene. He could only watch in horror and awe as she drew two swords, one of them his, and unleashed herself upon them. They didn't stand a chance. So she kind of takes them out, but he looks at her and it says, after all these months, he saw the lethal predator he'd expected to find in the mines. There was nothing human in her eyes, nothing remotely merciful. It froze his heart. So I feel like this moment is also going to be a defining one between the two of them. Finally, one of the, the hooded men is like, enough, enough. And he tells the archers not to shoot. She's like, get out of my way or I'll cut you into pieces. But the hooded man with the ancient voice was rushing to them, arms spread to show he wasn't armed. Enough! Put down your weapons, he told the guard. The guard faltered, but Selena's swords remained at the ready. The old man took one step toward Selena. Enough! We have enough enemies as it is. There are worse things out there to face. No, there aren't, because I'm here now. So she's like drenched in blood, because of course. Please, the hooded man said, pulling off his hood and mask to reveal a face that matched his ancient voice. Short cropped white hair, laugh lines around his mouth, and crystal clear gray eyes that were wide with pleading. Perhaps our methods were wrong, but I don't care who you are and what you want. I'm taking him now. Please listen. There's a guard who's like charges at her. She goes after him as well. And then someone's shouting her name. She sees the flash of a steel tipped arrow shooting for her and a glint of golden brown hair. And then Archer hit the ground, the arrow that was meant for her in his shoulder. And he's like, this is a misunderstanding. 
and he's wearing black robes like the rest of them. Of course, because of course Archer is more than he seems. Of course he's smarter than he seems. No one gives him credit because he's a sex worker, but like he's embedded in all of this and Selena really should have figured this out before now, but she did not. And she's like, unchain him now. Hear me out first. Unchain him now. They unchain him. And she says, you have one sentence to convince me not to kill you all. One sentence. Archer says, I have been working with Nehemia to lead these people for the past six months. Chaos stiffened, but Selena blinked. It was enough for Archer to know he'd passed the test. Leave us. Okay, so twist. Nehemia is involved with them. He says, Nehemia and I have been leading this movement together. She came here to organize us, to assemble a group that could go into Terrison and start gathering forces against the king and to uncover what the king truly plans to do in Aurelia. Kael tensed. That's impossible, is it? Why is it that the princess is so busy all the time? Do you know where she goes at night? Then she remembered how Nehemia convinced her not to look into the riddle she'd found in Davis's office and had been so slow and forgetful about her promise to research the riddle. She comes here to feed us all the information you confide in her. If she's part of your group, Selena ground out, then where is she? Archer drew his sword and pointed it at Kale. Ask him. A sharp pain twisted in her gut. What is he talking about? I don't know. Lying bastard, Archer snapped. My sources told me you the king informed you over a week ago of the threat to Nehemia's life. When were you planning on telling anyone about that? We brought him here because he was ordered to question Nehemia about her behavior. We wanted to know what kind of questions he'd been commanded to ask, and because we wanted you to see what sort of man he really is. That's not true, Hale spat. That's a damned lie. You haven't asked me one thing, you gutter-born piece of filth. I knew about the anonymous threat to Nehemia's life, yes, but I was told she would be questioned by the king, not me. And we realized that, Archer said. Moments before you arrived, Selena, we realized the captain wasn't the one, but it's not questioning they're going to be doing tonight, is it, captain? This doesn't 100% make sense because they did not ask him any questions, so somebody's not being entirely truthful here, but okay. And so Archer's like, I just sent men to the castle a moment ago. Perhaps they can stop it. Where is Nehemia? She heard herself asking. That's what my spy discovered tonight. Nehemia insisted on staying in the castle to see what kind of questions they wanted to ask her, to see how much they suspected and knew. Where is Nehemia? They aren't going to question her, Selena. And by the time my men get there, I think it will be too late. Selena turned to Kale. His face was stricken and pale. Archer shook his head again. I'm sorry. Okay, so one thing is she'd been told that this group was wanting to work with the heir of Terrison. And I think it's clear that Nehemia knows that Selena is that heir. I don't know that she's told any of them who she actually is. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe she did because they did this whole thing to get her there. But this, obviously, this is a big betrayal. Chapter 29 is a short one. Selena runs back to the castle, leaving her weapons behind her, and is like, who would the king use if not Kale? Who? The glass castle loomed closer, its crystalline towers glowing with a pale greenish light. Not again, not again, she told herself. Please. So she runs up the stairs, goes to the hallway of Nehemia's room, sees the door shut. There's no sign of forced entry. She opens it, and there's blood everywhere. Um, Nehemia's bodyguards are laying with their throats cut from ear to ear, their internal organs spilling on the floor, and on the bed, on the bed, there's the princess's broken body atop of it. Nehemia was dead. And that is the end of part one. So this is one of the most criticized things that Sarah has done in the series, and I think understandably so. I also think from things that she said is that she's realized this was not a great way to go, that the one person of color we have in the series sacrifices her life so that the white character can turn into the savior of everybody else. It's it's not it's not great and it's really unfortunate. I kind of hate that this is how this happened. I think there were better ways of doing it. There were other ways to create enough conflict for Selena to realize that she needs to go after the king. I don't love this. Uh, and I think it has been criticized understandably so. Does it have a big emotional payoff? Yes, because we love Nehemia and because they have such a close relationship, but I, it, it this could have been done so differently and so much better. So that's where we're at. I am going to read the next 10 or so chapters and then we'll check back in. 
Hi friends. So I am editing this and I did not realize how much I talked. <laughs> so when I uploaded the footage, there was like almost five hours of raw footage. And even after editing it significantly, it's still just so long that I've decided I'm going to split this up into two parts. This video is ending here and I will be back in a couple of days with part two, which will be the rest of the book. That'll be a little bit of a shorter video because it's not quite as many chapters, but I think this is gonna be the best way to do it just because it's an excessively long amount of content. I hope you enjoy the very detailed chapter recaps and discussion. It was a lot of fun to film. I just hadn't been uploading it as I went and didn't realize quite how much it was going to be. So we're stopping here. I will be back with part two. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And I think for future books, I am probably going to split it up into parts just so that it's not unmanageable. Again, talk to me in the comments down below. If you're reading along, I would love to hear from you. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.